Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second meeting of the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. I am Min Wen, and I am the designated federal officer for the task force. We have a full agenda today. This is a public meeting. We will have officials from the Department of Health and Human Services to provide remarks. As a reminder, this meeting is being live streamed and recorded and we are providing American Sign Language interpretation for those with hearing impairment. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Masala Nunnesmith, Chair of the Task Force. Thank you so much, Dr. Wen, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to welcome you to this second meeting of the Federal COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. Right up top, I want to take a moment and recognize Secretary Becerra and Assistant Secretary Levine. Thank you both for joining us. We'll be hearing from them shortly to provide us with updates from HHS. Uh, we're very much appreciative of the agency's support of the work of the task force. So the objective of today's meeting is to discuss interim recommendations on equitable COVID-19 vaccine access and acceptance. But before we begin that urgent work, I, I think it's important for us to pause and just anchor in the context uh, and in this moment. In these past few weeks, we have again borne collective witness to intolerable hate. We must stand in solidarity with everyone whose lives have been forever altered by hate-fueled violence. We must be motivated to achieve transformative change. There is an absolute and critical role for responsive and proactive policy to meet this moment. This is essential for our nation's public health. So I think it's appropriate to remind us of our charge as a task force. We have been asked to provide specific recommendations to the president through the coordinator of the COVID-19 response to mitigate health and social inequities that have, quite frankly, just been made all the more evident by the pandemic. We know that those inequities are driving unequal burden of risk, suffering, as well as sequelae in communities that are minoritized, marginalized, and medically underserved. It is also imperative that we recognize and name the historical and contemporary underpinnings of these structural realities. We know the communities that are always the first to be forgotten, especially, especially when resources are in short supply. So as we hold together our work as a task force, we are mindful of the broad, broad lens that is needed to center equity across the most affected groups. People with disabilities, those who are justice involved, older Americans, our rural neighbors, mixed status families, queer people, people of color, indigenous people, those on the margins of the economy and others. And of course, to recognize the compounded challenges often found at the intersections of these identities. And now we see the unacceptable rise in xenophobia towards Asians, Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. And in his first week in office, President Biden signed a memorandum condemning and combating racism xenophobia and intolerance against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. The fear of racial violence is far too great for far too many. So in addition to making recommendations on the equitable distribution of COVID-19 resources, such as PPE and testing, treatment and vaccines, and absolutely looking ahead to resilience in our recovery, this task force is also charged with considering guidance specific to cultural responsiveness, best practice, language access, and sensitivity towards Asian Americans and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders in the federal government's COVID-19 response. So as a task force, we take our charge very seriously. We will continue to push for the disaggregated and targeted data that are necessary for a data-driven response. Data invisibility is not acceptable. And we will elevate the positive assets and the wisdom often ignored or undervalued in the hardest hit communities as we generate recommendations and guidance. 
So we turn this to today's focus, which is about equity in terms of vaccine access and acceptance. A vaccination campaign will only be successful when it reaches everyone. Vaccines need to be free, and they are. There are no out-of-pocket costs. They also need to be easy and convenient to access. Privacy must be protected. And people absolutely need their questions asked and answered so they can have the information they need to make the decisions. There are currently three COVID-19 vaccines authorized for emergency use in the United States. The data have all been reviewed free of political interference by independent scientists and found to be highly efficacious on the things that matter most, preventing severe illness, hospitalization, and death after full immunity. And millions and millions of vaccinations have been administered safely to date. So there is much to celebrate, right? We see evidence of real world effectiveness and hope as vaccine supply increases, allowing eligibility windows to open up sooner for all adults. Uh, the federal administration has been able to reset new targets, inspire optimism towards a new normal, even as we remain vigilant in the home stretch. Yet, the benefit of scientific discovery has been uneven. Goal six of the national strategy calls our attention particularly to race and place. These are two consistent drivers of health opportunity in our country. And we see both race and place correlated with vaccination to date. If we look at the national data on race ethnicity, people of color are getting vaccinated at rates lower than their populational share. If we consider zip code, which we also know is a stronger predictor of health and genetic code in the US, we see similar patterns. People who live in counties at the greatest social risk are also getting vaccinated at lower rates. We have to, we must remain laser focused on improving the quality and the completeness most certainly of our equity data. We discussed this at length at our first task force meeting. We're encouraged to see progress on the data collection and reporting fronts. But in addressing how we collect, protect, and use data, we are committed to continuously engaging with those who have been made invisible and otherwise harmed by data to date. So equity takes intention. It is at the center of the federal vaccination uh, program. You know, many states, tribes, territories, local jurisdictions also following best and promising practices. The federal government has set up federally run community vaccination centers in hard hit areas provided and, and continues to provide vaccine supply directly to community health centers, expanding eligibility, providing vaccine supply directly to local pharmacies, launching hundreds of mobile clinics to meet people where they are, in addition to vaccinating our dialysis patients. And importantly, the rates of demographic data reporting across the federal vaccination channels is very high. And this is in due to interagency efforts, FEMA, DOD, VA, CDC, HRSA, many others. And we see early success vaccinating people in the highest risk groups and areas through these programs. For example, over 60% of people vaccinated at federally run vaccination centers and at community health centers identify as people of color. And 45% of pharmacies in the federal retail pharmacy program are located in hard hit neighborhoods. We know vaccination venue matters. We know attention to location is necessary, but insufficient. Our awareness must include those structural barriers that need to be overcome. You know, whether that is about registration challenges, transportation limitations, the need to build to sustain trust. So here again is where resource partnerships are just key with community and faith-based leaders and others. You know, the COVID-19 Community Corps officially launched working together with trusted messengers who are leaders in their communities. You can help, right, facilitate additional vaccination venues, assist with registration and transportation, support targeted geographic eligibility and flexible hours to counter the misinformation and disinformation campaigns that often go unchecked. And of course, to uplift the need for time off, site accessibility, and language access. So there is still much work to do. You know, the efforts to achieve equity through these federal vaccination channels, they're not intended to replace the equity work, of course, that states and local governments need to lead with their vaccine allocation. And the federal administration is committing substantial resources, again, with a heavy focus on local partnerships, to expand access to COVID-19 vaccines and to build vaccine confidence. 
So as a task force, we are eager to share guidance on COVID-19 resource equity. And we will be deliberating today on interim recommendations that may be modified ahead of a final report. So although today's discussions will largely focus on the age groups for whom COVID-19 vaccines are currently authorized, we do anticipate some unique considerations specific to pediatric vaccination and may begin some of those conversations today as well. We know there are other issues on the horizon, the emergence of so-called vaccination passports, questions regarding employer mandates, issues of mental and behavioral health, the syndrome of long COVID, just to name a few, certainly all with equity implications. So as Dr. Wen said, we have an ambitious agenda to cover today. We will be hearing from three guest experts and thank you in advance for joining us. Ms. Samantha Ortega, Dr. Nadia Islam, and Dr. Kara Ayers. They will all provide additional relevant content expertise. You know, the work of the task force is organized across four subcommittees and each of the task force subcommittees will share interim recommendations for group consideration ahead of our public comment. We will deliberate further as needed ahead of task force voting. So I will do so again later, but I want to say thank you right at the top to the federal staff team, the task force members. Your work has been tireless. The sprint has been quick to get us to today. Many, many subject matter experts have also joined and shared their insights along the way. We're grateful for that. So this is April, it's National Minority Health Month. I wanna reiterate what we all know about equity work. You have to show up and you have to listen. You have to learn. We need to approach this with humility. Communities remain the best experts in what they need. So each of you, the public members attending today represent the richness of communities across the country. I continue to remain grateful to be in this work with you. With that, I'll stop and turn it back to you, Dr. Webb. Thank you. So now I will conduct a member roll call. This is for the meeting record. So when I call your name, you may respond with present. Myra Alvarez. Present. Jessica Cottichan. Present. James Hildred. Present. Andrew Imperado. Present. Victor Joseph. Present. Janae Condon. Present. Octavio Martinez. Present. Marcella Nunes Smith. Present. Tim Putnam. Present. Vincent Torenzo. Present. Mary Turner. Present. Homo Ventus. Present. Bobby Watts. Present. Hey Young Yoon. Present. Madam Chair, we have a quorum for the meeting. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Assistant Secretary Levine for some welcoming remarks. Well, good afternoon. Thank you. I am Dr. Rachel Levine, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Assistant Secretary for Health within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And it's my pleasure to join you today for the second meeting of the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. It's really wonderful to see everybody. Of course, it's virtual, uh, but to see so many colleagues from across the federal government, new and other longtime partners from many sectors all working towards the same important goal of mitigating the health inequities that have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, our work and the work of the task force is to ensure that we prevent such inequities in the future. We have all faced a very difficult and challenging year in the United States. COVID-19 has been taxing physically and mentally, especially among racial and ethnic minority communities and other vulnerable populations. It is so important to mention that all of us, especially those in hardest hit communities, we have to remain committed to our basic public health measures for a while longer. We need to ask people to wear a mask, wash their hands, physical distance and avoid large gatherings. We need to continue to do that. And as we work to, to distribute and administer the vaccines, it's critical that we identify the questions and the concerns about COVID-19 in general and the vaccines in particular, 
and work to successfully answer them. So your all advice, insight, and recommendations have never been more necessary than now. You all have a unique opportunity to influence this historic effort by making recommendations to the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the President of the United States to help ensure that no one is left behind as we continue to tackle this urgent health crisis. Now, it is my great honor to introduce the 25th Secretary of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra. Secretary Becerra is the first Latino to hold the office in the history of the United States. As Secretary, he will carry out President Biden's vision to build a healthy America, and his work will focus on ensuring that all Americans have health security and access to health care. Throughout his career, the Secretary has made it his priority to ensure that Americans have access to the affordable health care that they need to survive and thrive from his early days as a legal advocate representing individuals with mental illnesses through his 12 terms in the House of Representatives to his role as the Attorney General of the State of California. Secretary Becerra is committed to ensuring that everyone in our country has health and hope each and every day. And I look forward to working with him on tackling COVID-19 and health equity issues. Secretary Becerra. To Dr. Levine, uh, thank you so much for the introduction. More importantly, thank you for taking the post as Assistant Secretary for Health at HHS. Uh, and to Dr. Nunes Smith, thank you so much for leading this effort and for everything you've done to give you the not only the might, but the, the wisdom to do this. I know you've been working towards this for a long time, and to get to do it at this level, I think is fantastic. Uh, to the members of this task force, can I just salute you right now and say, uh, 30 years ago when I started in Congress, would I have believed that based on the President of the United States, there would have been a task force like this, with this many uh, qualified and capable people? America, you know, it always redeems itself, and that's the beauty of our country. But I, I have to say this. Look at the folks who have spoken so far. If we're not talking about equity and equity in health, just look at the people who have so far addressed you. And there is, I think, as clear a sign of the commitment of President Joe Biden to make equity and health equity a top priority for this administration. So I thank each and every one of you who are part of this task force for the work that you're going to do, because it will inform not just this administration, but for years to come, where this country goes. So we thank you for that. I have to use the words of another, not just famous American, but one of our true champions in this country. He, uh, he was around making difference, making change back in the mid 1800s. And you're probably going to recognize him by the quote. He said, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And I mentioned that today because at that time when he said this, uh, there were many of America's children who didn't have a chance to believe they could grow up and be strong. Uh, America quite wasn't ready to accept all of its children. And when Frederick Douglass said that, I know he was talking about all children, but he certainly knew what it meant when we would forget, neglect many of our kids simply because of what they looked like, what their religion was, the language they spoke. But those words ring so true even today. It is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. That's what I think this task force at the end of the day is about. It's building strong Americans by giving every one of us a chance to participate. And I think it is nothing short of fantastic that the word on making a difference when it comes to equity, health equity, dealing with COVID-19 the right way with everyone involved, that word comes from the very top. So President Biden just isn't giving us words, he's giving us deeds. And this task force will reflect those deeds. But more than that, and here's the real kicker, he's bringing resources to the table. And I know Dr. Nunes-Smith knows this. I know that 
Uh, Dr. Levine knows this, I know this, because HHS is going to have not just the power of its word, but the power of resources to make a difference when it comes to health equity. So I have to say it now, and I know you all have said it as well. Thank you, President Joe Biden, for walking your talk. It is good to know you've got someone at the top who wants to do this right. Now, COVID-19 has exposed what many of us have known for a long time. This country has pockets where there are forgotten Americans, invisible Americans, and worse, sometimes even if they're not forgotten or invisible, they're hostily targeted Americans, as Dr. Nunez Smith pointed out earlier. Whether you're a rural American, you're an American of color, whether you practice a religion that sometimes is the target of hostility, uh, we know what happens. And so I must tell you that for me, this is personal, whether it's because of the stories my father would tell me as a young man where he could not walk into the restaurants to eat the food he had just finished picking from the, from the fields because of the signs that said, no dogs, Negroes, or Mexicans allowed. Or whether it's what I see going on today with too many of our fellow Americans. Uh, this is personal. I think for many of you, this is personal. And so when it comes to health, it becomes even more personal. And I felt that as well, but in a good way, because as the son of immigrants, a father with a sixth grade education, we had health insurance when I was growing up. That was because my dad, as a laborer, was able to get insurance through his union. And when my mom had a health scare and had to be rushed to the hospital bleeding, we knew that we would survive it. I didn't really know what I was about four years old, but we knew we would because we didn't have to fret if we could afford to go to the hospital and have give my mom the care she needed. Those are the kinds of experiences too many people who've been left out and forgotten can't uh, really tell you about. And so equity has to be part of what we live and do. And I'm here to say to you right now that equity will be part of everything, at least so long as I'm Secretary of Health and Human Services. Equity, equity will be part of everything that we do at HHS. And so whether it's dealing with vaccine confidence in some of our communities, whether it's making sure that when we produce data to tell us what to do when it comes to the healthcare, we make sure we've included everyone in those surveys and in those uh, sample projects to make sure that everyone has been included to, to uh, produce the kind of data that we need. We want to make sure it's clear. Equity will be part of everything we do. And so to each and every one of you who have served on this task force, aim high, push hard, put your soul in it, and let us together build strong children. Thank you for what you do. Thank you so much, Secretary Becerra and Assistant Secretary Levine. This is, I, I am, we're going to take you at, at your word, right? And we want to be held accountable. We have had this conversation before, right? That we know this is an important moment, an opportunity. The task force is definitely leaning into this. We are deeply appreciative for the leadership here at the agency and to underscore, of course, that the president and vice president as well. So this is a very unique moment, as has been reflected and observed, where equity is at the center. Um, and there is deep wisdom here on this task force. And, uh, and I'm sure you're eager to hear the recommendations we'll be discussing later on um, in the second half of the meeting. But I thank you both for joining. Um, uh, we'll take a moment now to, to hear from some of the folks here on the task force. I think it is just uh, essential that we pause now and remind ourselves of, of who's been working hard um, in service of the equity mission these past weeks to get us to this point. I will ask just for each uh, task force member as we go around, just a reminder for, um, uh, for those who might be viewing of who you are, you know, where you're from uh, and any organizational affiliation. And of course, uh, you know, what motivates and drives you should you um, be interested in sharing. So I'm going to ask for uh, Myra Alvarez to get us started. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Nunez Smith. Uh, I have the honor of serving as president of the Children's Partnership. We're a California policy and advocacy organization focused on advancing child health equity. 
I live in the great city of San Diego, California, and our organization is based in Los Angeles. I bring with me to this role my commitment to ensuring every child, regardless of their background, has the opportunity to grow up healthy and thrive, and a recognition that children are a part of families and families are a part of communities. Coming from a state that's been as hard hit as California and representing a Latinx community that's dying from COVID-19 at an alarming rate, I'm honored to do all I can to ensure our work to advance equity in our nation's COVID response. Uh, a response that centers the needs of our Black, Indigenous, and people of color, the communities that are not only disproportionately impacted by COVID, but are also on the front lines, working many of the jobs that are helping keep our economy running and support the many of us that are privileged to work from home. I'm a proud daughter of Mexican immigrants, and I'm honored to bring my personal and professional experiences to the critical work that needs to be done alongside my fellow task force members, Chair Nunez Smith, and partners across the country in ensuring a more equitable response to COVID-19. And I would just say I'm, I'm honored for the comments of Assistant Secretary Levine and Secretary Becerra, and uh, we're proud to call home, uh, to be the home state of our secretary. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hildreth. Hello, thank you, uh, Chairman Nunez Smith. And first, I want to express my sincere gratitude to President Biden for making equity a focus of his administration, which is long overdue. Um, I'm president of Mary Medical College, it's one of the four black medical schools. We've been around since 1876. We were created to give opportunities to learn health craft for African Americans. We're also created to provide opportunities to get medical services for those who could not get it. Um, I'm a virologist by training and immunologist. And when I was about to uh, embark on my journey to be a transplant surgeon, HIV occurred and it became obvious that this was gonna be a problem that impacted people of color disproportionately. So I changed my career plans and I've been studying HIV for the last uh, 35, 36 years. And that path has taught me the chasm that exists in the health status of people in our country. And so when COVID-19 occurred, it was like the same song with a different melody. And uh, I'm really <laughs> proud and pleased to be a part of trying to find some solutions. And again, I wanna thank the president for this opportunity and thank the chairman for her leadership. And I look forward to uh, trying to contribute to some solutions. So thank you for allowing me to do this. Thank you. Mr. Andy Imperato, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Andy Imperato. I'm coming from Sacramento today where I am the Executive Director of Disability Rights California. Let me join Myra in expressing pride that the Secretary of Health and Human Services is from the great state of California. I'm also glad to be a fellow Stanford Law alum, so I'm proud of you in that regard as well. Uh, I have lived experience with bipolar disorder, so like a lot of members of the task force, this is personal for me, and I appreciate your acknowledgement of that, Secretary Becerra. Um, before coming to this job, I was Senator Harkin's Disability Policy Director on the U.S. Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, and I ran the American Association of People with Disabilities. And I just have to say how delighted I am that disability is part of the equity conversation we were the first group that uh, the chair mentioned when she talked about all the different groups that are impacted by COVID and thinking about health equity and social equity. So I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be here and humbled to have this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Mr. Victor Joseph, there he is. Good morning. Good morning. It's, it's great being here. Um, it, it's such an honor and, and seeing Secretary Becerra and also Assistant Secretary Levine and listening to your comments yet again. As a, as a tribal leader, it's been very important for me to work on the American Indian Alaska Native issues, especially when we see the, the high levels of impact on our tribal communities. And once again, in not a good way, we're seeing that a high percentage of uh, disparities impacting this group of people. 
it's just great working with this group of people that have been put together and working on a common cause to help improve equity across all bodies. And with that, I just say thank you. Thank you. Dr. Caldew, please. Morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just really want to thank you, Madam Chair, uh, President Biden, um, for the opportunity to serve on, on this task force. Uh, my name is Joni Keldoon. I am the Chief Medical Executive uh, for the state of Michigan, currently helping to lead our state's response to COVID-19. Uh, but I also have the opportunity to, and, and work in the emergency department at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit uh, as an emergency medicine physician and I have throughout this pandemic. Uh, I'm also obviously a black woman um, and I'm a, a mother as well. And, and I am, um, this, this work, as was mentioned, is quite personal for me, seeing how uh, this, this virus has ravaged our entire state, particularly our communities of color, but also how it has impacted uh, people working on the front lines in our healthcare communities um, and, and seeing how uh, it continues to just, just really surge, particularly as everyone's aware, I'm sure, in, in Michigan um, and starting to surge across the entire country. So being able to be a part of this work uh, is quite personal for me and my family, and, and it is quite an honor. So thank you. Thank you. Dr. Martinez. Hello, Madam Chair. Hello. Um, I'm the executive director of the Hogg Foundation for Mental Health. We're part of the University of Texas, located here in Central Texas, in Austin, Texas, in fact. Hawk Foundation for Mental Health, uh, we have been diligently working toward health equity and especially from obviously a mental health perspective uh, for, for, for everyone. What really drives me is that, you know, I believe everyone, all families, all communities really should have access to uh, quality care with the best health outcomes. That's what we need and what we deserve. We can only though achieve this if we really eliminate disparities and work toward achieving health equity. And for the, um, another thing that drives me is personally, and I know many here on the call, colleagues and across the nation have experienced loss and grief. We really have. Um, the Hogg Foundation itself has lost a beloved staff member. And uh, in my circle of, of friends and, and folks that I know, there've been losses as well due to COVID-19. Just recently, a few days ago, I was notified of such. And so this is extremely important for all of us and so I thank the President Biden for the appointment and definitely am very uh, keen and aware uh, of, of, of everyone here. And so I thank you. Thank you. Dr. Tim Putnam. Thank you, Madam Chair. I um, have the privilege of being the CEO of Margaret Mary Health, a community hospital in Batesville, Indiana. I work alongside a group of brave and talented healthcare professionals who fought this pandemic for too long now and seen too many of our friends and family suffer from it. Uh, I have the honor of working with a lot of rural providers and rural people across the nation, hardworking men and women that have seen their access to healthcare subside over the years. And I will tell you that every group that's represented here when they're issues are exacerbated by living in a rural area where they have limited access to health care and virtually no internet, um, it becomes much more worse, much worse and a much greater challenge. I really have to appreciate say appreciation to President Biden for valuing equity. I, I believe if we as a nation value equity and make it a priority, we are a stronger nation. And it's really appreciated that he sees that and you see equity listed in so many of the initiatives that he's done so far. So thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you. Mr. Vincent Taranzo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Vincent Taranzo and I am from Pembroke Pines, Florida. I serve as State Secretary of the Florida Association of Student Councils, where we uh, constantly advocate uh, for student voices to be included in government decisions, important decisions in our country and our state. As a young person, I am committed to serve on this task force for the disproportionately affected youth across this country who have been struggling with their mental and behavioral health uh, during this pandemic and long before this pandemic. 
and want their voices heard within our government. You know, it's, it's leaders like Secretary Becerra that make me proud to be a Latino American. So I just want to thank uh, Secretary Becerra and Assistant Secretary Levine and the Biden administration for their leadership, as well as Dr. Nunes Smith uh, for her commitment to lead our group. And I'm incredibly honored to serve alongside my esteemed colleagues to pursue a common goal, which is to ensure that our response to this pandemic is centered around equity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mary Turner, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hello, my name is Mary Turner. I am president of Minnesota Nurses Association, which is a proud affiliate of National Nurses United. But more importantly, I'm a COVID ICU nurse on the night shift at North Memorial Medical Center in Robbinsdale, Minnesota. And I have actually been in healthcare, uh, the healthcare field since I was a 12 year old candy striper. And this time next year, so that will mean I will have been caring and comforting pe patients for 50 years. And the reason I mention this fun fact is that as a registered nurse, it is my privilege and duty to always advocate for the highest quality of care um, for, the patient, for all of my patients. But for me, it goes beyond just a job description. Bringing care and comfort is something that I have done my entire life. And that drive to seek the very best care for my patients is literally a part of who I am as a person. So as for my role on this task force, not only am I representing the frontline healthcare workers. As far as I'm concerned, the nation and all of its people are now my patients. And as such, my focus will always be what is the highest quality of care that I can deliver to them. And may I add also, it was the best day ever when I could personally meet President Biden. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, Dr. Homer Venter, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the Secretary and Assistant Secretary. My name is Homer Venters. I'm a physician and epidemiologist, and uh, I've spent my career focusing on health care uh, for people who are incarcerated and promoting the health of people who are involved in the justice system. I'm um, just thrilled to be part of this group. Thank you to the other panel members. Uh, I've spent the last year of my life uh, doing mostly court-ordered inspections or investigations of COVID outbreaks in jails and prisons uh, and immigration detention centers around the country. Um, and making recommendations. Uh, these uh, endeavors have really solidified for me uh, how the substandard care, the lack of access to care for people who are incarcerated is one of the greatest representations of racism and health uh, in our country. And so working with colleagues here to promote uh, more equitable access to testing, to treatment, to vaccines uh, is really a, a privilege for me to be able to work on. Um, and also, to use this time and emphasis to rethink uh, not just how we provide better care behind bars, but how we rethink uh, mass incarceration itself and how we start to use our skills and our public health um, acumen uh, to document how incarceration harms health. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bobby Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I also want to express my appreciation for the heartfelt remarks from uh, Secretary Becerra and Assistant Secretary Levine. Uh, I'm Bobby Watts, the CEO of the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, which is headquartered in Nashville, and but support and supports the 300 federally qualified health centers that have a special emphasis on serving people without homes, and also the more than 100 medical respite programs, also known as recuperative care in California programs throughout the country. Uh, at the council, we believe, and I believe that healthcare and housing are human rights. And that is the basis and the starting point from, um, for all that we do. Um, professionally, my uh, public health training is in health administration and epidemiology. And personally, uh, I am African-American born in a segregated hospital in North Carolina. I grew up in a poor neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York, and from an early age have seen the effects of 
discrimination and racism and what it does to disadvantaged communities and especially how it impacts health. So I'm thrilled to be part of this task force looking for bold recommendations to give to the administration so that we can attack this virus and attack inequity at its root. I appreciate this time. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hay Young, you please. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you, Secretary Becerra and Assistant Secretary Living. It's I am deeply uh, grateful and honored to be part of this task force. My name is Hei Young Yun. I'm the Senior Policy Director at the National Domestic Workers Alliance. We represent 2.2 million domestic workers who were deemed essential in the heights of pandemic, and they care for uh, young children, people with disabilities, older adults, and keeping our houses clean. Um, so, and it is thrilled to be part of this task force and really appreciate the administrations and also H uh, Secretary Bassar and Assistant Secretary to really think about health equity broadly and not only ground and center equity, but really think about all the other structural inequities that prevent people from accessing uh, uh, public health. So really grateful to be part of this uh, task force at a personal level as an Asian American and in this height of um, the alarming rates of um, anti-Asian hate, anti-Asian violence, it is really, um, heartfelt to be part of a task force that is really looking at how to address and combat xenophobia, racism, and structural inequities. So I'm again, I can't say enough how humble I am to be part of this esteemed task force and work together to deliver some concrete, actionable recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I am inspired anew every time just to be in the company of the colleagues in the task force. Much appreciated. Uh, so with that, we are going to shift now and begin to anchor ourselves in our conversation that we will be having regarding the recommendations. So I understand uh, certainly to any of our, our guests are all welcome. We know schedules are tight um, and appreciate the time that you've been able to share with us so far, Secretary and Assistant Secretary. I, it is a great honor for me to be able to uh, introduce, and I will do so in turn, <laughs> three, um, three guest uh, experts who are going to be able to, I think, provide really key context for us as we begin to consider recommendations. Just by way of logistics, when I uh, have each speaker sort of speak in turn, and then after all three presenters have spoken, we'll have time for open uh, group discussion. It is my pleasure to first introduce uh, Ms. Samantha Ortega. So I'm gonna look and I'm gonna to, to, to share. Everybody is, is um, incredibly modest always in this space. Many, many accolades, I will only highlight a few. So Ms. Ortega serves as Vice President and Director of the Racial Equity and Health Policy Program at Kaiser Family Foundation, or KFF. And in this role, she leads KFF's work to provide timely, reliable data, information, and policy analysis on health and healthcare disparities affecting people of color and underserved groups, um, as well as efforts to advance racial equity in health and healthcare. Uh, Ms. Ortega's work focuses on the intersection of racism and discrimination, social and economic inequities, and health. She's also conducted extensive work related to the health and health care needs of low-income populations and immigrant families, and previously served as Associate Director of KFF's program on Medicaid and the uninsured. Now, Ms. Ortega holds a master's degree in health policy from the George Washington University. We're just very thrilled you could join us today. I will hand the floor over to you. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you so much for including me in today's discussion. I'm really humbled to be a part of it. I want to really start out by expressing my gratitude to the esteemed members of the task force and the expert leadership of Dr. Nina Smith, as well as Secretary Becerra, Assistant Secretary Levine, and the Vice President and President. If you'll give me a moment, I'm just going to share some slides that I want to 
uh, use today to walk through the research that I will be sharing. Um, so today, what I'm really going to be focusing on is what our work at KFF has revealed about gaps that have emerged in COVID-19 vaccinations so far and efforts to address those gaps. There's a lot of information that I'm hoping to share with you today in a relatively short time. Um, so here, I just want to include a little bit of background information on my organization, KFF, or Kaiser Family Foundation, for those of you who may not be familiar with us. And as noted on the slide, the information I'm presenting today is my own and does not represent any views of the federal government, and I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. So as was noted today, we are really gonna be focusing on COVID-19 vaccination efforts. But as you heard from the chair, it is vital that as part of this discussion, we start by recognizing the uneven impacts of the pandemic. As we know, data consistently show that the pandemic has taken a harder toll on people of color with them getting sick and dying at higher rates than their white counterparts. Data also show that people of color have been more likely to experience negative impacts on their mental health as well as negative financial impacts. And this context is really key for setting up our discussion of vaccination efforts since as CDC has indicated, it is important that we look beyond just vaccine equality, which would be the proportional allocation of vaccines based on population, to vaccine equity, which they define as the preferential access in administration of vaccines to those who have been most affected by COVID-19. So with that context in mind, we see that the data so far show us that those who have been most affected by the pandemic have been the least likely to receive the vaccine. At KFF, we have been conducting ongoing analysis of state reported data on vaccinations by race ethnicity. And while there are a number of limitations and gaps in these data, which I'll discuss later in my remarks, they show a consistent pattern of black and Hispanic people receiving smaller shares of vaccinations compared to their shares of cases, deaths, and total population across states that are reporting data. And I've just highlighted a few of those examples here. On our website, you can find the full data for all states that are reporting data. And what that means then is when we look at the percent of the total population who has been vaccinated by race and ethnicity, we see that across those states that are reporting data, white people were 1.8 times as likely to be vaccinated as Hispanic people as of the beginning of this week. But the size of that gap varies across states with the rate at least three times higher in some states. And we similarly see that the vaccination rate among white people is 1.6 times higher than the rate among black people with that difference again, varying across states and reaching at least three times higher in some states. And looking across time, we see that although vaccination rates are increasing across racial and ethnic groups, these gaps for black and Hispanic people are persisting with the absolute differences between these vaccination rates actually widening over time. So beyond these racial ethnic data that are reported by states, we also recently conducted analysis of county level vaccination data that's been made available by CDC. And what that, what that analysis shows us is that counties with higher shares of people of color, poverty, and uninsured rates, and that measure higher on the social vulnerability index, had lower average vaccination rates compared to those counties that had lower shares of people of color, poverty, uninsured rates, and that measured lower on the social vulnerability index. Now, we've talked about the importance of considering equity through multiple lenses. We don't have data to understand vaccination rates among people who identify as LGBT, but through some of our survey work that we've conducted at Kaiser Family Foundation, we see that uh, people who identify as LGBT have experienced disproportionate impacts of the pandemic, pointing again to the importance of focusing on them in vaccination efforts. We also know from those data that most LGBT people plan to or are open to getting vaccinated. So as we consider these gaps and disparities in vaccinations, 
I think there has been a lot of immediate media attention around vaccine hesitancy as a potential driver for some of the racial disparities we're seeing in vaccination rates in particular. However, as our COVID-19 vaccine monitor survey data shows, as of March, over half of people across racial and ethnic groups reported that they had already gotten the vaccine or that they wanted to get one as soon as possible. This to me really suggests that it is not differences in willingness that are a main driver of the gaps that we're seeing. In fact, as I think many of the people on this meeting know, the gaps we're seeing largely reflect long-standing inequities that create increased barriers to accessing the vaccine as well as healthcare more broadly for people of color and other underserved groups. For example, more limited resources to navigate the online signup processes that have been necessary for access to many of the early vaccines, more limited transportation options, less flexibility in work and caregiving schedules, including less access to paid time off to get a vaccine or if someone experiences side effects, higher uninsured rates, which may contribute to more cost concerns if people do not understand that the vaccine is available for free and which contribute to people having um, less connection to the healthcare system, potential lack of information about how, where, and when to access the vaccine, as well as linguistic barriers, confusion about eligibility and fears of potential impacts on immigration status, as well as potential challenges providing proof of identity or residence if that is being requested at a, by a vaccination provider. And what we see when we look at our survey data is that many of these concerns, uh, many of the concerns about the vaccine expressed by people reflect these underlying inequities that contribute to access barriers. Across groups, many people are concerned about potential side effects of the vaccine. But Black and Hispanic adults are more likely than their, than their white counterparts to be concerned that they might have to miss work due to side effects, that they won't be able to get the vaccine from a place they trust, or that it might be difficult for them to travel to a vaccination site. We also see that Hispanic adults are more likely than white adults to say that if they heard the vaccine was, was available at no cost, they would be more willing to get the vaccine, suggesting that some have concerns about potential costs of the vaccine and may not know it is available for free. This really points to the importance of making sure when people are trying to access the vaccine, it is clear that they do not need to have insurance and that they will not be charged for the vaccine, even though some providers have been requesting insurance information from people to cover their costs of administering the vaccine. So I've spent a lot of time focusing on gaps and challenges, but I also want to highlight some of the emerging strategies that are being implemented to address the gaps that have emerged. What we are seeing is steps taken at multiple levels to reduce access barriers by making vaccines more available directly in hard hit communities and by prioritizing appointments for people living in those communities by me and making more sign up options available that don't require people to have internet access. In particular, we're seeing on the ground examples of how when community based organizations or clinics lead vaccination efforts, they can be highly effective at reaching people of color. They're trusted by the communities they're trying to reach. They understand the access barriers that people face and they know how to reduce those barriers. We also are seeing more efforts to address people's concerns and questions about the vaccine through focused outreach and communications campaigns. As you heard from Dr. Nuna Smith, the Biden administration's efforts reflect many of these strategies to reduce access barriers, including increased funding uh, to efforts to vaccinate underserved communities with increased funding going to community health centers to further bolster these efforts. And what we see from the early data about who is getting vaccinated through community health centers shows us that most of the people who have gotten a COVID-19 vaccine through a community health center are people of color with a particularly high share of Hispanic people making up those vaccinations, really pointing to the potential effectiveness as, of community health centers as an avenue for vaccinating people of color. Beyond reducing access barriers to vaccinations, 
We also know it is important for people to have access to information to address the questions and concerns they may have about the vaccines and for that information to be made available through trusted messengers. Our survey data show us that healthcare providers are a top trusted source of COVID-19 vaccine information across groups. To that end, colleagues of mine here at KSS in partnership with the Black Coalition Against COVID and Dr. Rhea Boyd have developed a national campaign called The Conversation Between Us About Us, designed to provide credible and accessible information to Black communities through Black healthcare workers so that they have the information they need to make an informed choice about getting a vaccine. And I do want to highlight that we are currently in development of a similar campaign to address information needs among Latino and Spanish-speaking communities in partnership with UNIDOS. So as vaccination efforts continue, data are pivotal for our ability to understand who is and who is not getting the vaccine. Data also are necessary for establishing health equity goals that can be measured against going forward. And while we do have some data available, which you've seen in what I've presented today, significant gaps and limitations persist in the data that prevent us from having a complete and consistent picture of who is getting vaccinated. These gaps limit us from understanding the experiences of smaller population groups, as well as to understand the variation of experiences within the broad racial and ethnic categories. Today, for example, we released a focused analysis of vaccination rates, largely pointing to the success of vaccinations among the American Indian and Alaska Native community. Since we're not able to include that population in our ongoing state reported data tracking due to data limitations. We continue to lack standardized, consistent data by race and ethnicity for vaccination across states, which limits our ability to compare experiences across states and get a complete national picture. And I think some of the speakers following me today will further touch on some of these issues. But I wanna close by emphasizing why continuing to prioritize equity is important as vaccination efforts continue. Um, and I think the work on the task force to, to these issues is just gonna be pivotal and really appreciate your commitment to this. And I look forward to hearing your recommendations. Ensuring equity and vaccinations will be key for mitigating the disproportionate impacts of the pandemic for people of color and other underserved groups and preventing against further widening of those already large health disparities that were in place before the pandemic even began. We also know that reaching a high vaccination rate across individuals and communities is necessary to achieve population immunity and protection from the vaccine. But we know that because inequities are built into our underlying systems and structures, achieving equity is going to require deliberate intentional actions that work against those built-in inequities. And we've learned from what we've seen on the ground that we can build on and support existing community uh, resources and strengths as part of our efforts to move toward advancing equity. And with that, I'll close. And again, really thank you for the opportunity to share this information with you all today. Thank you. Incredibly helpful. I'll take a moment now just to say an additional thank you uh, to, to your team and everybody at KFF for really just being tremendous on uh, providing insight, these types of data insights on the questions around COVID-19 equity really from the early days, incredibly grounding and helpful for us. Just a reminder to ask task force members to please and hold your questions. We're going to have time to come back uh, and ask Ms. Ortega more about her presentation. I will, however, take this moment now to introduce Dr. Nadia Islam. It's always so fun because I have to look around the, the squares to find you. There you are. It's great to see you. Thank you so much. Um, again, just by way of a, a brief introduction, Dr. Islam is a medical sociologist, associate professor in the Department of Population Health um, at NYU. Her research focuses on developing culturally relevant community clinical linkage models. This is very important to reduce uh, cardiovascular disease and diabetes disparities in disadvantaged communities, but really this is a model across, uh, across disease types. As principal investigator, she leads in several National Institute of Health uh, and CDC funded initiatives evaluating the impact of community 
health worker interventions on chronic disease management and prevention in diverse populations. Um, she also directs the cardiovascular disease and diabetes research track for the NYU Center for the Study of Asian American Health, which is dedicated to reducing health disparities facing Asian American communities broadly. It is a national research center of excellence, also funded through uh, and by the NIH. She's also a research director at the NYU uh, uh, CUNY Prevention Research Center and principal investigator of a CDC-funded uh, racial and ethnic approaches to community health or, or REACH program project. So thank you again for making the time to join with us today and provide some additional context. I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to really thank the Health Equity Task Force for the invitation to discuss strategies to advance health equity for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities. I'm really humbled to be here and share my expertise and represent our communities. So if you could give me a moment to share my screen. Are you able to see the full screen? Yes, wonderful. So again, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I do hope that this is a first step in sustained and continual engagement with both Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities, who I'll refer to as NHPIs. Um, as Dr. Nina Smith mentioned, I'm on the faculty at NYU School of Medicine and part of the NYU Center for the Study of Asian American Health, the only NIH-funded research center of excellence with a mission of advancing health equity for Asian Americans. So my remarks today will center our work and the experiences of Asian American communities, but I'll also highlight some common data-related challenges across Asian Americans and NHPIs. Doctor, I'm sorry to interrupt just for one second. I want to be sure that we're seeing the correct view. Okay, let me see if I can fix that for you. Is it the full screen now? Yes. Great. Now it is. Thank you. Great. So I'd like to start with setting the context for any discussion of health equity in Asian Americans, and that's to discuss two distinct but mutually reinforcing myths that are applied to Asian American communities. The first is the idea of Asian Americans as a model minority, that we are more educated, harder working, have higher income levels, an idea that's been referenced in the media as early as the 1970s and has been consistently perpetuated, as you see here. The other is the concept of Asian Americans as a perpetual foreigner, the idea that we don't belong here, we are others, we're somehow different. Here's media coverage of the 2015 script Spelling Bee, noting South Asian American co-champions and the corresponding social media response to crying the lack of quote unquote real American winners. The idea of Asian Americans as perpetual foreigners has certainly been reinforced during the pandemic with references to COVID-19 as the Wuhan or Chinese virus, resulting in xenophobia towards individuals of Asian descent, an increase in hate crimes, and the tragic massacre of six Asian women in Atlanta in March. Upwards of 2 million Asian American adults have experienced anti-Asian hate since the onset of COVID-19, including one in eight Amer Asian Americans in 2020 and one in 10 in the first quarter of 2021. This context is important because it is both driven by and results in the lack of data equity in Asian American and NHPI communities. Data aggregation within and across Asian American and NHPI populations, which lumps together more than 30 unique subgroups, renders our communities invisible. As a recent American Medical Association Center for Health Equity report on API communities notes, what is measured is what is valued and what is undercounted tends to be counted out. So I'm gonna walk us through some illustrative examples. Let's start with educational attainment, which is this kind of central dimension of the model minority myth for Asian Americans. And when we look at aggregated data, um, we see that Asian Americans have a higher rate of educational attainment than other groups, as well as compared to the national average. But when we're able to look at disaggregated de data, this demonstrates a very different picture, calling attention to differences across Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities. When we look at poverty levels in the aggregate, 
and then here again, disaggregated by subgroup, we see a very similar picture with wide variation in poverty levels across Asian American subgroups. And these two findings are important because education and poverty are key determinants of health driving COVID disparities. Another critical factor impacting all dimensions of health for Asian Americans is language access and proficiency. Both Asian Americans as a whole and particular Asian American subgroups have high rates of limited English proficiency, about 30% overall for Asians, but up to as high as 78% in some communities. This invisibility put simply, is killing our communities. And this is nowhere better illustrated than in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, national efforts, put plainly, have simply left Asian Americans out. Um, in September of 2020, for example, about $234 million in federal funding was awarded to support projects across the country to improve access to COVID resources in underserved communities. The press release announcing the initiative did not include Asian Americans as a priority population, and indeed only a handful of projects include any outreach at all to Asian communities. Similarly, a framework for, uh, the framework for equity and vaccine allocation developed by NASM did not prioritize Asian Americans despite tremendous advocacy by Asian American researchers and advocates across the country. What's disheartening is that we are left out despite at this point ample evidence that COVID is disproportionately impacting Asian American communities compared to white populations. This analysis by Chu and colleagues looked at data, death certificate data from the National Health Statistics Center and found disproportionate burden of COVID among Latinx and Black communities, but also for Asian Americans and NHPIs. A number of other studies have demonstrated similar findings. For example, a systematic review last year of 18 million patients across 50 published studies found Black and Asian individuals at higher risk for COVID-19 infection compared to white individuals. And most recently, data from the Marshall Project has reported that because of COVID-19, more than 13,000 Asian Americans have died than usual, representing a 35% increase over the prior five-year average. When we examine disparities by subgroup, we get an even clearer picture. This is data, this is an analysis that our team led um, in collaboration with partners from uh, Health and Hospitals, which is New York City's safety net hospital system. This includes, this analysis included data from 80, 85,000 patients um, across the public hospital system from the period when New York City was really the epicenter of the pandemic. We applied a surname methodology to be able to better identify patients by subgroup ethnicity. And when we did that, we found that South Asian patients had high rates of COVID positivity, second only to Latinx patients, and high rates of hospitalization, second only to Black patients. And we found that Chinese patients had the highest mortality from COVID after controlling for age and gender. When it comes to vaccine uptake, um, national data that we have available makes it seem that Asian Americans have higher uptake of vaccine. This report from APM Research Lab aggregates vaccine data across 34 states and the District of Columbia. Um, similarly, data from the California Health Interview Survey has demonstrated Asians broadly have higher vaccine acceptance compared to other racial and ethnic groups. But here again, the lack of data disaggregation and data reporting issues plague our communities. The data you see here includes two states that do not report Asian race ethnicity data at all, and four states that combine Asian American and NHPIs. The other consideration is that early waves of vaccine data may be overrepresenting Asians due to concentration of some Asian communities in healthcare professions, notably uh, Filipinos, Asian Indians, Chinese, and Korean communities. In places where we are able to drill down, for example, in LA County, neighborhood level data demonstrates that COVID death rates and vaccination gaps are highest among the most marginalized, low income Asian neighborhoods, places like Koreatown, Little Bangladesh, Thai Town, and Little Cambodia. Again, data quality issues cannot be overstated and that's illustrated here. Race and ethnicity data is missing at both the national and local levels. In national data, almost half of race ethnicity data is missing for vaccines as of March 17th. 
Similarly, in New York City, almost 20% of race ethnicity data for vaccine uptake is missing. And this issue of missingness is a particular challenge for Asian Americans and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander groups because studies have demonstrated again and again that these groups are more likely to be impacted by missingness as well as more likely to be misclassified. So it's important to underscore that one size does not fit all when it comes to COVID solutions for any community. I think that's what this task force is all about, but it, particularly for Asian American communities. Um, Dr. Stella Yi and colleagues from our center have synthesized available evidence about how different Asian American subgroups are experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic. Outcomes, exposures, and impact of COVID vary, although there are some commonalities, for example, Asian communities are more likely to live in multi-generational housing, placing ma major limits on their ability to social distance, likely contributing to disparities. There are also some clear economic Im implications across Asian American subgroups. This includes loss of employment from closures of small businesses, for example, in Chinese and Korean communities, and enhanced risk of some groups like South Asians and Filipinos due to concentration in essential workforces like healthcare, but also other workforces like food service and transportation sectors. Anti-Asian hate and xenophobia have consequences across the pandemic spectrum, particularly for East Asian communities, including causing delays in testing and seeking care for COVID, but most recently fear of going to and accessing vaccine appointments due to safety concerns. So trust in messengers has been a common refrain throughout the pandemic. Um, but recently, Giselle Corby Smith wrote that engaging trusted messengers can only happen in the context of true partnerships with communities. Uh, community rooted partnerships play an especially critical role for Asian Americans, given the current context of anti Asian hate incidents, language access challenges and underlying assumptions by local jurisdictions that Asians are not at high risk that's really been driven by inadequacies in data collection and reporting. So two key players in this effort include community health workers or CHWs and community-based organizations. CHWs are trained public health professionals who have a close connection with the communities that they serve based on shared lived experience. Uh, the Biden administration has highlighted the role of CHWs in COVID relief. We are thrilled for the 330 million that's been allocated towards CHWs and support and applaud those efforts. Our team has further explored how CHWs work in partnership with community-based organizations to address the complex social needs and consequences of the pandemic, providing further opportunities for vaccine equity. So what I'd like to do is share two examples led by our team of CHWs and some of our community partners in New York City to really advance our thinking and offer tangible solutions for maximizing the impact of vaccine related efforts. Um, as you saw from some of the data I presented earlier, South Asian communities early in the pandemic were very hard hit in New York City. And so our team of South Asian CHWs offered navigation through really complex systems, including accessing unemployment, health insurance, cash benefits, and setting up food and medication deliveries and, and tables throughout neighborhoods. They've been active in mitigating fear and misinformation through in-language virtual town halls, but also really through simply providing one-on-one -on -one social and mental health support during a time of tremendous loss and devastation. They've also played a key role in addressing language barriers and challenges, but also digital divide issues in very concrete ways. And these were all precursors to serving as trusted messengers, trusted navigators to facilitating vaccine appointments, which they've been able to do quickly and efficiently. Another example I'd like to share is from one of our community-based partners, the Chinese American Planning Council. CPC in New York City has been linking community pharmacies with their home care programs to vaccinate homebound seniors. They've also implemented a bilingual chaperones program to accompany seniors to their vaccine appointments due to the rise in anti-Asian violence, providing access to safe vaccines and addressing language barriers. And what I'd like to highlight is that all of these efforts are being done by stretching current budgets, not with additional resources or funding. So my recommendations really follow directly from this. Um, first, all states must collect, analyze, and report disaggregated data separately for Asian Americans and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders and for Asian American subgroups. This is not new and there is plenty of precedent. By current OMB standards, Asian Americans and NHPI data should be disaggregated, which is not happening in a number of states. 
And we should also note that this is really a minimum standard. Um, in 2011, Howard Coe led a charge on data disaggregation efforts in Section 4302 from the ACA. So there are precedents to work with. And I hope I've underscored that for our communities, the data issues constitute an emergency situation. We have to demand that data disaggregation take place and that there's perhaps potential to do this through an emergency declaration. Second, we have to prioritize language access for Asian American and NHMPI communities across COVID-19 efforts. Language access, I, I don't think I need to underscore this to the committee, but language access goes beyond translation of materials, which also needs to happen accurately and with community review. Um, there's a great need for online and phone-based services that must be available in multiple languages, particularly that given the high rates of limited English proficiency across Asian American groups. Um, and also to offer interpreter services for on-site vaccinations. Again, I'd like to emphasize that our CBOs and community health workers across the country are doing this already, but are stretched to capacity. And this then leads me to my final recommendation, which is to really provide direct financial support to community-based organizations and community health workers to facilitate safe access to COVID-19 related services for our communities. This includes frontline agencies and federally qualified health centers. We applaud recovery plan efforts and funding, but really emphasize that the funds cannot only be directed towards state and local health departments. Our communities have robust systems of community support and infrastructure through community-based organizations, through faith-based organizations, through FQHCs, and these must be engaged and supportive if we want to um, advance vaccine equity. So I'm just going to end with acknowledging our many, many collaborators in this work. And I really look forward to the discussion and happy to take questions. Wonderful, thank you so very much. Extremely uh, insightful as well. Appreciate all of the illustrations um, and you know, thanks for the work that the teams are doing on the ground every day in affiliation with the center. Um, all right, I, I know people are building questions. Hold the questions, we're coming soon, soon to, to discussion. Um, I wanna be able to, to introduce our third panelist now, Dr. Kara Ayers, thank you so much again for joining all three of you. I know went through a lot to, to be able to be with us today. It's much appreciated. So Dr. Ayers is Associate Director at the University of Cincinnati Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. Uh, where well, she's also a professor. She earned her PhD in clinical psychology from Nova Southeastern University. Um, uh, she no longer uh, sees patients, but really importantly applies that professional knowledge, research experience, and personal perspective uh, to making systemic change to improve the lives of people with disabilities. So during the... Um, the LEND year, she supports self-advocate trainees and contributes to the LEND curriculum in the areas of disability culture, psychosocial development with disability and disability policy. She's very committed to, uh, to the belief that the voices of people with disabilities and their family members should be at the table, at every table, in schools, workplaces, and communities. I think that is a very appropriate introduction. Dr. Ayers, <laughs> welcome. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's my honor to be here today. Uh, let me just share my screen. All right. So I'm going to be speaking about equitable vaccine access for people with disabilities. Um, and I've include, included some disclaimers and disclosures. Um, my conclusions I share will be my own, but I don't have any conflicts of interest to report today. Um, so Dr. Nunez Smith provided an introduction. I just wanted to highlight um, my role at the USED in Cincinnati. Um, each of you in your states and also in the territories have a USED and they're an excellent source for disability data, which we'll be talking about um, as an issue, but um, perhaps the best source in your state are these USED. So I wanna highlight those. I'm also the director of the Center for Dignity and Healthcare for People with Disabilities. And we're a national coalition that have been working closely on these issues um, of COVID specifically for more than a year. So let's start with some level setting about disability. It's a very heterogeneous group and it's difficult for researchers to define. There's still not total agreement on um, what makes up a definition, which 
further complicates gathering data. But I think what I want to emphasize is this is not a small or insignificant portion, proportion of our population. Most F estimates average, we're talking about about one in four adults in the United States have some type of disability. And you can also see this map, which goes down to its interactive, Mathematica released this map just a couple of weeks ago, and it goes down to county level data. But you can see that the, the, um, the concentration is not equally distributed across our country. So there's a higher concentration in the South, and you can also see some other regions like the Appalachian region here as well. It's also important to mention the different types of disabilities and how the, our community is very diverse within. So this graph from the CDC captures some differences in prevalence and type of disability, but it's so important to recognize that there's overlap across these different groups. And what I also want to point out are just starting to think about the different needs that we need to consider as we make vaccine access more accessible for all. And it's essential that we think about these groups and we challenge ourselves as health policy professionals and especially when we have medical training as a background that we think about the disability community beyond their medicalized dis definitions so people with disabilities are also more likely to live in poverty we're more likely to be multiply marginalized whether it be that we're also people of color or members of the LGBT community so there's a misperception there's many misperceptions about the disability community but I want to ensure that we start by level setting around who makes up this community um, another mis misperception that has been magnified with the pandemic is the idea that our community must already be well established with medical providers given that many of us do have many health care needs and that's actually not the case one in three people with disabilities didn't have access to a usual health provider before covid so you can think about how that is magnified um, now and the implications for that i like to zoom in a little bit more of our focus and highlight people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, a group that are particularly marginalized, especially during this pandemic response. In addition to understanding who these people are, it's essential that we think about where we can access them for information and equitable vaccination. So most of our states we've seen have started with state IDD systems to reach this population. And while that's a start, it only makes up about 20% of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who are served by their state IDD agencies. So we can start there, but we certainly cannot stop there. I know that we've all heard multiple analogies during the pandemic, and as a psychologist, it's one of our tricks of the trade, I guess, to encourage people to think differently and think deeply. And so an analogy that I have found fitting is that we, yes, we are all riding out the same storm, but we're doing so in different boats. And I think that people may think that our different boats are related to our disability. The fact that I use a wheelchair for mobility or that someone may be blind or deaf. But in our case, um, our boats have been more so impacted by the treatment that we've received. And as we strive for equity, we have to recognize that uh, equality can't guide us because we haven't experienced this pandemic in the same way. And so we have to base our recommendations on what we've learned. To give you some idea about those differences and the disproportionate impacts, I wanted to highlight some data around the disproportionate outcomes um, in in both um, contracting COVID and also mortality rates for people with disabilities. So in a study of 64 million, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities were 3.5 times more likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19. Another large study by Gleason and colleagues found that people with IDD were twice as likely to be hospitalized. Um, and people with IDD are also much more likely to die from COVID. Most studies finding people with IDD are between two and three times more likely to die than those without IDD. So we have these original sources as well as other research summaries um, linked in my slides, but also on our Center for Dignity website, centerfordignity.com. And I want to emphasize again that these discrepancies are alarming and it's so imperative to understand that they are not explained by worse health outcomes. There was a lot of really um, frankly hurtful narrative, especially in the beginning of the pandemic response as if vulnerable populations were expendable. Um, these outcomes are influenced by inequitable treatment as well, which is avoidable, preventable, and influenced by ableism. The idea that our lives as people with disabilities have less value. And unfortunately, that message of devaluing disabled lives has been sent multiple times during the pandemic from our policy decisions. And now is the time to turn the corner and live out our value for equity. But to do so, we must address a few problems. 
First, um, as others have mentioned today, the pandemic has magnified some longstanding problems that are worsening our community's outcomes. And in this case is in itself a public health crisis. We have a major disability data problem. We are missing pieces. We have inconsistent reporting, failure to reach consensus on definitions, and entire missing population data. Several opportunities surveys have been missed to include disability data. Even including IDD in death certificates is not standardized. So we are likely under-reporting, not over-reporting the massive loss to our community. So we cannot forget disability when we're modernizing our public health data systems. We've also seen the challenges faced by the disability community and the extreme variability across states in their vaccine plans. So as many states recognize the need for equity early in drafting these plans, and most of the plans have a section actually labeled as such, almost none included even the word disability in those plans. And this was a major missed opportunity. Even when we're talking about equity, we're not remembering that disability is part of that picture. So we can't leave disability out any, any longer. In response to the variability that we saw across the different states um, early in the vaccine rollout, our Center for Dignity team in collaboration with Dr. Bonnie Sweeners Disability Health Research Center at Johns Hopkins and with support from the American Association of People with Disabilities, we developed a vaccine dashboard that we've um, been happy to busily update every week as we've been able to reflect what types of disability definitions were prioritized um, week by week week by week with each state. And again, even the definitions varied. So advocates were able to use this tool to at a baseline figure out when they were eligible, but also to advocate to their state for their needs to be um, more inclusive of other high risk groups. Um, we've expanded the dashboard to respond to other needs that we've heard from the community. We started tracking caregiver access to vaccines. And most recently, we've added some data visualization and also some rankings for both the information pages that states have and the registration pages that states have. Um, we all benefited from knowledge shared by the Kaiser Health News report a few weeks ago, highlighting the major accessibility issues with the vast majority of state websites. So this they surveyed more than 90 websites and only 13 didn't have significant major errors. Many state websites have hundreds of accessibility errors. And to give you an example of what that may mean, it may mean low contrast text, which would mean if you have a visual impairment, you're not able to read the information. In other cases, it's things like including a phone number that someone may need to register as part of an image, which makes it completely inaccessible to someone who's blind and using a screen reader to access this information. So we have to do better than this. We update this dashboard weekly, um, and we want to be busy making updates showing that these states are fixing these accessibility errors. This is a map of just illustrating um, some of the states and the distribution of these errors. So this map shows the state information websites and you can see the darker colors illustrate the bottom third. So those have the most accessibility errors. And what stands out to me is that unfortunately these are also some of the harder hit areas um, from COVID. So I, we also have a visualization and again, this is as of this week. So this map shows the state registration websites for accessibility. Accessibility. And what stands out to me with this map is the massive number of white states that simply don't have one centralized state registration website. And what that means is that the registration websites are just distributed across multiple, um, and that, that also happens in some of the states who do, but um, those white states don't have an option for someone to go to a state-led um, registration page. Again, you see states that have, in some cases, hundreds of accessibility errors. In my mind, he is just direct hurdles stopping from being able to act towards equitable vaccine distribution is that we know that it's influenced by science, what research has been conducted, which has its own kind of culture around it, data, which we've talked about as a challenge, and policy. And I know that there's been a heavy reliance on ethics to make these tough decisions, but I just want to highlight that we need to be aware that that field as well has a history of ableism. Uh, the utilitarianism approach that guided early rationing care guidelines for crisis care standards directly devalued our lives. And we, we can't really just kind of move past that. It's still influencing our decisions today. Um, and another note on ethics, most of these state vaccine plans, as we looked through them, claimed that their guiding ethical principle was minimizing loss of life. Yet, 
many of these same plans did not prioritize people with disabilities and high risk groups in their priority groups. So this just doesn't add up. We have to make sure that things align. Some recommendations, oops, um, let me go back one. There we go. So some recommendations that I would share is that we have to remember that people with disabilities, thankfully many of us live in the community, but this makes us more difficult to reach. So states did have done fairly well reaching the congregate care settings where many people are living in one place, but those settings have come with their own deadly risks as well. So we have to get creative and figure out how to reach people that are more distributed in their community. We got to go beyond people that are directly connected to their DD and other formal disability systems. And we also have to remember access needs at the vaccination sites. This can't be an aspiration. It has to be an expectation with accountability coming along with it. We have to overcome those barriers before, during, and after the registration process. We have not crossed the finish line until people are have received, you know, in some cases their second shot and are, are through that process. We can't drop the ball in the midst of it. Um, I also just wanna highlight that we can learn from these lessons and plan for pediatric distribution to our youth with disabilities and children with disabilities. So we don't have to start from square one. And I'm really looking forward to that day when, when my children receive their vaccine. Some best practices that have emerged along the way are accessible websites that we have seen. And so we know what to do. They're, these aren't mysteries that we have to solve. We just need to expect it done and do it. I've been happy to see states that have used a self-attestation process. There could have been a significant log jam if we required different high-risk groups to gather documentation. And I was happy to see that that wasn't a barrier. But I also heard from providers who said they felt left out of the process, that they, for some high-risk people, especially those with rare diseases who weren't specifically listed, they wanted to have an option to be able to contribute, and they didn't quite know how. We've, we've mentioned the importance of phone registration and transportation barriers, and just listening to the disability community for some creative strategies, things like mobile vaccination sites. But as we hear of some of these things pop up, I want us to have the same urgency that I hope we all still feel today. So just yesterday, I heard from a friend and a colleague who has finally been able to schedule his vaccine appointment in the home because he's unable to leave his home due to his disability. But his appointment is for August 15th, and that's unacceptable. He's in a very high risk category. So we can't just stop at finding these creative solutions. We have to do so with the utmost urgency. And in closing, what people with disabilities need is we need direct representation. We need seats at the table, adv advisory committees, ethics committees from people with direct lived experience. We have to be represented beyond our medical definitions. We need better data collection at both federal and state levels, and we need equitable care in the hospital. Unfortunately, this pandemic is raging on in our hospitals and our community members are dying due to inequities in care. So we can't forget that battle as well. And we need to live in the community. We We've seen the cost of lives for congregate care settings. So I'm so thankful for the president's focus and investment in home and community-based services. We have to see that through the finish line. Lives are at stake. The good news is you are not alone in searching for these solutions. I encourage you to look to disability advocacy organizations, including those that might work on issues that you may not think are directly related, but definitely have key insights to add here. So disability orgs that work on employment, accessibility, housing, transportation, each of these have something to add. And as we pull these together, we can help get through um, not only the vaccine, but beyond as well. It's always my hope um, that you remember to include disability in discussions around equity. It's an honor to be here to actually make that happen today, but it has to go forth after today. And unfortunately, from the start of the pandemic, when our community faced um, the realities, not only of the disproportionate loss of our members, but also of the rationing care guideline, guidelines, should we be sick? We were explicitly told that our lives were expendable and the disability community has felt left out. Um, I'm thankful to be able to sh share my perspectives today. And I hope that our many voices are heard. I am an optimist and I truly believe that lessons learned from the experiences through this pandemic can help us improve not only our vaccination efforts, but our overall public health response in working with the disability community now and in the future. So I hope we all take advantage of these opportunities for growth. And again, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share this information with you today. Thank you so very much. Thank you. There's three outstanding, just stellar uh, presentations for us, right to the heart of the matter. Particularly appreciate 
um, the very pragmatic, strategic approach that each of you took in terms of where there are gaps that we might address. So thank you again for joining. We, we have time for question and answer and some discussion and conversation. So I will open up the floor to the task force uh, members, please. If you use the um, raise hand function, I think I will be able to track. Um, we'll start with Mary, please. Thank you. My question is for um, for Dr. Nadia. This one. Uh, so the public health system has been basically decimated across the country, and I, I I noted that you are putting an emphasis on the whole concept of the community health workers playing a huge uh, part in healthcare now, um, but. I come from the perspective that we need to we need to ensure the highest standard of care for people. And so what is being done about addressing the issue of increasing the amount of public health nurses, epidemiologists, and other healthcare professionals? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I, I think I would respond that, you know, CHWs are fundamentally a complement to other members of the healthcare workforce. And I think their uniqueness is that they very much play a bridging role between communities and the health system in particular, but between communities and other systems of care. And that's part of why I wanted to highlight the really critical role that CHWs played as trusted messengers. Again, that's I think a refrain we hear again and again. Um, part of that status of being trusted messengers is that they have the lived experience, they are from the communities that they're serving, and they also know that healthcare doesn't happen in the 15 minutes of, an, of a patient visit, you know, that it's happening out in the community and is being influenced and contextualized by social determinants of health. And I think during COVID, we saw this so acutely, you know, there was within a two week period, death and dying happening all around us in, in our communities, um, really juxtaposed by loss of employment, um, loss of income, um, you know, made, made worse by issues related to not, access, not being able to access services due to language, but also simply fear, fear in all kinds of ways, and particularly for immigrant communities, fear was very nuanced and, and multi-level. Um, and so I think CHWs play a role in complementing the healthcare workforce. I don't think in any way they replace the, the nursing workforce um, or, or other members of the healthcare team. I think, I think you're right that there is a lot of interest in integration of CHWs into healthcare systems. I think there needs to be structures in place and you know, part of the, there's a lot of resources going towards CHWs that it, there needs to be careful attention to making sure that infrastructure is supported as well to be able to support the integration of the CHW workforce. That includes appropriate supervision. That also means that it may not make sense to just place a bunch of CHWs within healthcare settings. I think we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Our, and this is why I paired community-based organizations and CBOs. I think we, our CBOs have a lot of rich resources in terms of community health workers other navigators um, and, and bilingual individuals who can play that role. And so I think supporting um, CHW placement in those settings as well is key. Thank you. Let's go to Andy. And then after that, uh, Octavio and then Myra. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question is for Dr. Ayers. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, at the beginning of the meeting today, our chair talked about the intersection <clears throat> between disability identity and other identities. And I'm just wondering if you've seen data that, that gets more granular about what's been the experience of people with disabilities who are also African-American or Latinx within the pandemic and whether the strategies to reach those populations need to change at all compared to the broader strategies that you recommended related to people with disabilities. Thank you, that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, I can't 
I can't point to an excellent data source that uh, illustrates that um, intersectionality. We know that it's present. And so I think my best sources of input have been not only observations from the community, but listening to those um, that are members of different intersectional groups. And I definitely do think that that there are more specific recommendations. There are reasons and extremely valid reasons that there's a distrust in systems, especially from disabled people of color. And so we need, um, not only do we need trusted messengers, but we need more equitable healthcare systems so that that trust can be gained. And we need to, we, you know, in healthcare for people with disabilities, we encourage people to self-advocate and ask good questions. So we by no means need to expect people to, to seek a vaccine, especially with all of these access barriers, without getting their questions answered in an accessible way. Um, and then it also comes down to where, um, you know, the basics of vaccine access for these population groups as well. Um, so I think that we we can't, I, I wish we could kind of merge not only our three presentations today, but there are definitely um, takeaways and lessons that overlap across those. So I do think it's really important not to look at the groups that you've heard from today as separate groups, but as overlapping layers that we can each learn some, some best practices from. Thanks, Andy. Dr. Martinez. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to commend our three esteemed uh, presenters of excellent presentations. I learned so much. Uh, I, and, and this is for all three of you to see who will weigh in on this. It made me think about that, you know, health economics uh, impact of the fact of not gathering data. What does that, what, 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 are, what is this really costing us? Because for example, uh, inequities are more expensive to all of us because what it ends up doing, it removes the opportunity for prevention or a public health approach. So I'm wondering if you have any studies, anything you can share with us, uh, because I think that the business case also is an important aspect that could really move uh, the agenda forward for health equity. So I can start and then if the others want to jump in, I, there are not specific studies I have to point to, but I think the overarching point you make is exactly correct in that we all suffer costs and poor health as a result of these inequities. And I think the lack of good, readily available, disaggregated data delayed our ability to understand how the virus was impacting different populations, which then prevents against really efficient um, response efforts, right? So that delay in data to get the complete picture of how the pandemic was impacting communities and individuals that makes it more difficult to efficiently and effectively focus resources on those areas that are most impacted and address the specific needs of individuals who are impacted. And similarly, we're seeing that again with the vaccination rollout that not having that detailed data readily available inhibits those efforts. So I think it points to that having high quality, comprehensive, consistent data enables us to then more effectively, efficiently target resources, focus resources um, to respond to needs as they arise. Thank you. Maybe you could go after that study for us. <laughs> I definitely heard that asked there. Did any of the other panelists want to make a comment about the health economics? Yeah, I would um, reiterate that that delay really cost us and, you know, it was almost a punitive cycle in the early days um, for people with disabilities, uh, for disability specific data at the state level, as we were advocating um, to governors and to their different committees about the different high risk needs, we were hearing things like, well, show us the data for that group if you want us to prioritize that group. And so we were trying to explain that we don't not have data because, you know, it's not a high risk group. This is a long standing problem that, you know, has been brought up by disability for a long time but so there was a cyclical approach of that you know we were told show us the data and we were saying we don't have the data we haven't had the data but we have this that we can pull together and show you so unfortunately what also happened in response to that was that it, it kind of became the 
you know, the hunger games of advocacy, you have which groups are better funded and louder and have political power, which is, you know, really um, not the position that we want to be in if we're seeking equitable care. And I think the, the other thing I would mention making the business case is I have been impressed with how nimble and agile, you know, some grassroots organizations have been. And I hope that we consider that, you know, there's a disability justice organizations in California that had responses, you know, stood up in days, not weeks. And so when we look at, I think, you know, federal funding is extremely important, but we all know that those wheels take a while to turn. So we have to get more creative when we're going to, you know, use need agility to reach some of these harder to reach populations. Yeah, I think I would just add to that uh, two things. One, you know, I share this in my presentation, but, you know, there, there is a consequence in terms of resource allocation for our communities. You know, I mean, we Asian Americans and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders have really been left out of federal COVID initiatives in, in very real, vividly clear ways. Um, and then, you know, I couldn't agree more with Kara regarding this sort of vicious cycle of not having the data and having to prove that you have disparities. Um, you know, in our analysis of the h, &H hospital system, 85,000 patients, we found that Chinese patients were, had the highest likelihood of mortality from COVID. That was only, we were only able to do that after applying this very rigorous and innovative sort of surname matching methodology. We wouldn't have been able to do it with the existing data. Um, and, you know, we believe that those disparities may be a result of sort of this climate of anti-Asian hate and real delays in seeking care related to COVID. Um, and, you know, I would just kind of, I, I think everybody has underscored this, but, um, you know, we really need to listen on the ground. You know, that that H, H analysis was driven by healthcare providers within H, &H hospitals in places like Elmhurst um, and other city hospitals where they were saying, you know, we, we're seeing this in, in these communities, but we don't see it in the data anymore. We're not seeing it in the city data. We're not seeing it being talked about, you know, and so I think, um, yeah, I would just, I would just add that. And thank you. Ms. Alvarez, please. Thank you to our speakers uh, and your insightful presentations. This is a question for Ms. Artiga. Uh, one of the slides, actually a few of your slides, really highlighted how um, successful efforts to um, reach communities, particularly marginalized communities, are building on efforts that we've seen have been successful in reaching communities of color, like community health centers, right? That the, going through those channels, those trusted channels of communication, um, going where people are has, has been what has worked in as far as vaccine access and allocation. Uh, can you talk a little bit about if any of your data or, or conversations and focus groups have identified new opportunities to reach communities of color or have has it only focused on building on what we know has worked in the past? Um, would love to hear more about that. Um, I think what we are hearing about, again, um, is consistent with what we've seen over time, even if we look back, for example, at the ACA health coverage rollouts of who were the trusted messengers and helping people enroll in coverage as new coverage options become available. And it is really finding those points in the community that are already trusted among the community and that have established relationships. And I think it points to the importance of thinking broadly beyond just standard where people may get health care. And we've seen some of that in terms of the role of churches and religious organizations. You can see it in beauty and barber shops. You can see it among community-based organizations providing social support services. And I think it is a really, who those messengers are is going to really differ among each community at the local level in terms of who you're trying to reach. Um, but I think what is consistent in terms of what we know is that there's um, no need to reinvent the wheel, right? There are places and people that have relationships in place that understand the communities that they serve, that specifically know the barriers that they face to getting services and care and know how to address those barriers. And when those community organizations and people can lead efforts, they can design them in ways that meet the specific preferences and needs of the people that they serve. And I think that is what we are seeing in some of the examples of um, successful on the ground vaccination efforts that are coming to pass. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. This is, uh, I, I certainly appreciate everyone's input. I think you've made us a, a uh, more informed and better group. So thank you so much for that. The question I have for Dr. Ayers, and, and you hit on something that I don't think this group has talked about nearly as much, and that is the difference, the amount of people who did not have access to an established primary care service beforehand. And I think there's a real difference pre-pandemic if you didn't have that, uh, what your access to testing, what your access to diagnosis or treatment was beforehand. I, I noted that you said a third of people with disabilities do not have access. I, I'm wondering if you could tell me why it's so high and what we do about it. Yeah, good questions. I mean, I think like all answers um, with our community often, it's complicated. One reason that is cited is that people may divide their care across specialties if they need, but um, specific to maybe their disability. Other disabilities may not have health needs um, that are predictable and, and like many Americans, unfortunately, may not set up as adults a regular primary care provider until an issue arises, which can create a number of challenges. But you're exactly right that it um, makes those challenges of testing and vaccination even more difficult. And you can, you can also think about how that might be magnified if there might be specific disability related needs related to testing or vaccination. So I'm thinking of also um, some autistic advocates that have shared with me that, you know, these massive vaccine vaccination sites are really inaccessible to sensory needs um, for some that may be too loud. So being having the option to be vaccinated with their primary care physician, if they have one, may be exactly the accessible kind of route that they need. But up until the last few weeks, and in many cases, some of the prioritization groups, that wasn't an option. So even among those that did have a primary care physician established, there's been this, this challenge in kind of working them into the vaccine um, the vaccine process in the last few weeks. We hope, you know, I hope to see that improve now that there's more distribution and access. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. So please, so the task force members, just join me in thanking our three panelists once again for just outstanding presentations. Um, you should know, it, I, I wasn't very honest up front, I mean, inviting you to join, but you don't get off the hook. So you continue to be held close to us as we move forward with the work. We will be circling back as we revisit some of the recommendations. Um, and please do continue to keep us updated with all of your insights and discoveries uh, moving forward. Tremendously, tremendously helpful. Um, so thank you. I will turn it over to Dr. Wen. Yes, so let's uh, probably take about five minutes break for everyone. And then we will resume at 3.56 Eastern time. Thank you. Thank you. Around this theme, examples of what they recommended will be standardization of the demographic data and providing uh, incentives to update existing data systems both at the local and state level, as well as collecting missing data and creating robust, equitable data systems so that we will prepare our nation to equitable respond, not only at this pandemic, but in future. The second uh, theme that emerged is around increase in equitable vaccine access, as well as looking at the healthcare confidence. So giving you a context on this is around uh, the fact that we need to uh, be intentional around outreach, partner with local organizations, uh, CBOs and local health centers to make sure that we are uh, deploying trusted community members and messengers to do this work, as well as making sure we have PPEs and other things that the healthcare providers need to be able to deploy and do the work they need to do. Uh, the third theme is actually around engaging marginalized communities. And I'll give you context around that. And that is the, around the aspect of engaging stakeholders that are within the minority population, the population that are hard to reach or hard hit populations that we need to engage. And it circles around including providing uh, access to language, broadband, and other telehealth systems 
uh, that they needed to increase access. The other last theme that came up has to do with actually improving vast and accessibility through collaboration and communications. And this also include looking at the eligibility, making sure there is guidance uh, so that people are not worried and people know that they can easily have access, including diversifying the vaccine registry and localizing the venues. These are just uh, high level themes and I've actually covered the next two slides because we don't have much time. And I will really appreciate it as I turn it over to our chairs so that they will present to you the amazing work that they did. And I will begin by calling on Myra Alvarez, who is the chair for our Communications and Collaboration Subcommittee. Myra. Thank you, Martha. Uh, so it's my honor to represent the Communications and Collaboration Subcommittee. Our subcommittee was created to explore how issues related to communications in all its various forms and collaborations, both within the federal government and with external state and local partners, can contribute to a more equitable response to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as future pandemics. I'm honored to serve on this committee with Andy Imperato, Octavio Martinez, and Vincent Taranzo. As it relates to vaccine access and allocation, the subcommittee identified three overarching problem statements to tackle through our recommendations. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, fe first, federal, state, and local communication strategies about the vaccines, they're not reaching marginalized communities effectively. There's misinformation, there's language challenges, there's an overall lack of consistency and coordination. Comments that we heard our speakers already go into detail about. Second, structural barriers uh, uh, are impacting marginalized communities' access to vaccines. We know that much of our national attention has been placed on vaccine hesitancy, but we believe that the real challenges in vaccine access are structural. Things like adequate access to information, transportation, the internet, uh, language-appropriate materials, healthcare, much, much more. And finally, our nation's public health infrastructure is not set up to adequately support an equitable response to the pandemic. We know that resources are tight, but beyond this, it, our public health infrastructure often lacks the relationships necessary to engage with marginalized communities or to build that trust that these communities need or to offer care and services in that culturally and linguistically responsive way. So knowing that these were the challenges, we identified a set of recommendations to respond in both the short and long term. Next slide, please. Now there's a lot of text, so I'm going to talk you through this. To respond to problem one, which is really around communications, we have five recommendations. First, the federal government should lead a coordinated vaccine education outreach and communications campaign, one that leverages the reach of the federal government, focuses on messages related to the importance of family, and works with trusted messengers to share information where people are. Again, this is really picking up on what many of our speakers have talked about and what the Biden administration is moving forward and seeking to be that coordinating voice um, and leader across the country. Second, we know that communications is not enough on its own and that the government must also use its leadership to issue clear guidance, particularly in the form of frequently asked questions and other mechanisms on critical issues related to vaccine eligibility, processes, and education, building on what we know has already been done and shared by agencies like the CDC and others. Especially in the short term, we suggest that we offer guidance on issues like definitions of high-risk populations, or the benefits of using self-attestation, or how to ensure immigrant communities, particularly the undocumented, have a right to be served and make such information available in multiple languages in, in accordance with national standards such as the national class standards. We also believe that uh, our recommendation centers around the theme of centralized leadership and directs the federal government to operate a clearinghouse on vaccine eligibility, access, and allocation across the country. This is particularly important because building on Ms. Artiga's comments, we're taking lessons learned from past efforts, like the rollout of the health insurance marketplaces through the Affordable Care Act, but also the census, including things like a centralized website that offers every American access to vaccine-related information in their state and community, and also offers information to that information in additional formats, knowing that not everyone can get online. So how do you get that information via the mail, 
email, phone, as well as in-person assistance, which we're going to hear more about. Fourth, in keeping those lessons in mind, uh, we suggest the federal government host regular monthly or even weekly calls with various stakeholder groups, offering opportunities to hear critical government updates, but also an opportunity to listen to community feedback and challenges that will inform future work. And finally, the administration should really maximize its unique reach to draw public attention to the pandemic emergency through many mechanisms. The president's weekly address, virtual fireside chats, a prominent cabinet meeting. We already see the Biden administration doing this, and that draws more attention to the collective response that we have to have in this emergency. Next slide, please. To respond to problem two, we have five recommendations that seek to leverage the power of collaboration to address those structural barriers. Given last month's announcement from the White House, as well as the previous grant opportunity released by the Office of Minority Health, we're encouraged that these recommendations are going to build on an already strong commitment. So first, recommending that the federal government strengthen its commitment to community-based organizations, particularly those that have a demonstrated record of working with and for communities of color, people with disabilities, rural communities, immigrants, LGBTQ, and other marginalized communities. By providing that robust funding so to reach our, our communities and while requiring grantees to help amplify that coordinated communications campaign I talked about earlier. Second, we recommend that in the short term, federal departments provide clear standards on what works best when trying to reach marginalized communities. Doing this in partnership with national trusted partners that have that state and local reach because we want to recognize the value of community leadership and knowledge and how it benefits states and counties. Third, in line with what we noted in communications earlier, we recommend a hosting of, of a series of televised local town halls, leveraging interagency collaboratives and working together with private industry to reach more Americans. Again, these are incidents that we already see happening. Fourth, as part of this commitment to collaboration, we recommend the government work closely with local leaders and grassroots organizations when launching its federally supported vaccination sites. This is particularly important because we want to give nod to that community community leadership, centering that, that expertise, and that we're leveraging local efforts, efforts like a door-to-door -door strategy to reach people where they live, particularly for homebound individuals. And fifth, we recommend that our federal civil rights enforcement agencies provide clear guidance and oversight to ensure that vaccine deployment is fully accessible to people with disabilities and people who need access in languages other than English, offering recourse for vulnerable populations and being able to coordinate um, in a matter that people know um, they're being listened to. Next slide. And finally, to respond to problem three, our recommendations focus on strengthening our public health infrastructure in both the short and long term. Um, first, through commitments to supporting deployment of community health workers, individuals that, like Dr. Islam has already said, individuals that live in and share culture, language, and life experiences with the members of the communities they serve. Um, but our recommendations also emphasize the need to offer guidance on best practices to better reach marginalized communities. How can the federal government serve to uplift what works? so states can leverage that information in their local programs as well. Uh, and we also use uh, the federal government to, we suggest the federal government leverage and mobilize its own networks of regional partners. What we already know are trusted resources in the community, health spaces like community health centers, independent living centers, uh, home and community-based long-term services, but also other federal programs, child care centers, our schools, minority-owned small businesses, and others that we know have the trust of the community and can serve as critical partners in vaccine deployment and education. In addition, we recommend coordination with our public, our relevant public health associations, ASTO, NACHO, and others that distribute information, have the reach at the state and local level, and can leverage that coordinated communications campaign I spoke about earlier. And finally, the federal government should require and invest in a state-specific vaccine distribution registry site in every state through that clearing house that assists you know, governments, hospitals, health centers, and others in achieving the logistics of allocation. Now, I recognize this was a lot of information to cover, and we, we truly value the feedback and questions. And before I hand it over to our Madam Chair to facilitate discussion, I just want to give a, a brief moment to my fellow committee members if they have anything to add. My Martinez is, yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. 
A great presentation, Marin, on behalf of our committee. Uh, I do want to highlight uh, really those trusted voices and how important they truly are. Uh, especially, we already talked about community health workers and promotoras. I would like to add certified peer specialists. They have an, a, an important role to being uh, messengers as well as a part of the clinical team. These are individuals with lived experience who have undergone uh, specialized training. And in addition to community health workers and promotoras, uh, they're in that category, but I would really like, like to call out certified peer specialists as well. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, please take it away. Thank you so much. Maybe we could um, stop share just for a moment. It's easier to see everyone and, uh, and invite others. I, I'll just start by saying, of course, congratulations to the committee. A really um, robust uh, set of recommendations in response to quite uh, clear, urgent, immediate problem statements. Um, and, uh, and so we have moments now for, for others to weigh in, ask questions, reflect on, on that. Yes, please, Jessica. Great, uh, thank you so much. And this is from beginning to end has been really informative. Uh, Jessica, again, from the Department of Education. I'd love to do some more thinking on it. Um, we've been thinking um, just around the role of community-based partners um, and organizations. We've been thinking about how schools are often the hub of many communities in terms of re-engaging with families and getting information out there. Um, we are hoping more and more students will, will safely return to school and um, have been thinking about engagement strategies, rebuilding trust with students and families after the last year. And, I, I think part of uh, the, those efforts, I think, overlap with this as well. And so as we're reaching out to re-engage families, students and families around returning to school, but also accessing social, emotional, mental health supports, uh, meals, nutrition programs, we can also work in around vaccine and other health services as well. And so that if we are communicating with them, we can be communicating with them about a, a number of resources that are available to them. Um, and the other piece, which I think is also really important is, uh, are we developing relationships that are partnerships with community-based organizations that extend beyond COVID, um, that we can kind of continue to tap into whether it is, you know, another health crisis or something else where having those established relationships and partnerships are already in place. Um, and those relationships are built. So would love to just do more thinking internally with our team at Ed and just are incredibly grateful for the, the work that's gone into all this. So thank you. Thank you. That's every sense. Andy, please. Yeah, uh, Andy Imperato with Disability Rights California. I just wanted to lift up the recommendation about potentially having a cabinet meeting focused on vaccines and equity the federal government, different agencies have their own kind of connections to different communities. I think about Department of Interior with Native American communities, you know, the, the Administration for Community Living at HHS got some funding from CDC in the past couple of weeks to do more targeted outreach to folks with disabilities. But I think if the whole federal government looks at their ecosystem and their infrastructure and relationships, there's a way to reach populations that might be hard to reach if it's just one part of the federal government trying to lead that effort. So I just wanted to kind of echo support for the idea of having a cabinet meeting focused on this. Great, thank you. Mr. Joseph, please, and then Ms. Turner. Thank you. This was a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. In fact, I've been enjoying the whole meeting as we've been going through the various presentations. Uh, the recommendation I would like to see or add is when you're talking about under your first goal or your problem statement and then under your first action, the federal government should lead a multi-pronged vaccine education outreach and communication campaign. I was wondering if um, you would be uh, willing to accept culturally appropriate, appropriate multi-pronged public-private health education outreach system because I feel that is going to be really important reaching out to do the various peoples. The second thing that I was thinking about uh, during a recent tribal leaders meeting when they were talking about uh, not only vaccine hesitancy but brand hesitancy 
And so if you can include that in your first paragraph too, I think it would be really good. And so I would just make that as a friendly amendment. Um, with the last part on collaboration, really wanting to strengthen that up because it has been proven when all bodies are working together, uh, you have some really great output. And Alaska is an example of that when you, when the tribal health organizations, the state and the federal government work together with other entities to roll out vaccines in some very difficult and challenging access areas. So I just wanted to throw that out and thank you once again, it was a great presentation. Thank you. And absolutely. Yep. Thank you for all of those wonderful recommendations. Um, well, I definitely recognize the fact that community health workers are a trusted and important voice and navigators. Um, do have some ongoing concerns about, and hopefully we can flesh this out in future discussions about describing the actual roles that they will have. Nurses uh, believe that uh, health equity means that everyone deserves the same high quality of care and having the right licensed professionals um, give that care. Um, but so at this point, still have some concerns about the community health worker, but I certainly after today see the, the validity, validity of having them work as partners. Thanks, Mary. And, and definitely the recommendations at this point are very high level and are intended to go into greater detail as the process moves forward, which will be far more collaborative than, than just our group, right? Um, but thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I don't know, CNC, do you guys have a, have a shorthand yet? Thank you, CNC <laughs> subcommittee. Um, just really outstanding. Thank you. So I don't see any additional discussion right now. Dr. Okafor, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Excellent job on um, robust uh, recommendation discuss. And I will turn it over right now to our um, chair for data analytics and research uh, subcommittee. And that will be Dr. Janae Kaldun. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Okafor. And I also uh, really want to thank my subcommittee members, Dr. James Hildreth, uh, Andrew, Andrew uh, Imperato, Victor Joseph, and Dr. Homer Venters for really just the really engaging and thoughtful work that went into developing these interim recommendations. Uh, so our subcommittee focused on how the collection, <clears throat> sharing, and use of data needs to be improved in order to drive equity, not just for the current COVID-19 response, but also to drive equity overall in our public health system and to guide responses to other current and future public health challenges. And I also want to emphasize that we did spend some time speaking to external stakeholder groups, so representing epidemiologists and other experts at the local, state, and federal level who are really on the front line of needing to collect, analyze, and respond to this data. <clears throat> and it was important and will continue to be important uh, for all of us on the task force to seek many different perspectives uh, to inform the work of the task force as we refine our recommendations. So next slide, uh, we have two key problem statements and specific interim recommendations for each that we'll go through. Uh, the first problem statement reflects the fact that there really is a lack of comprehensive or standardized data, again, as our speakers have, have said, on COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, deaths, and vaccination coverage in our communities. And, and again, I can say this from a state level as well, data is either not collected at all, it's not collected in a granular or comprehensive way, or it's collected in different ways across the various parts of the system. And so that may be a testing location, a hospital, or, or a different uh, vaccination site. And this lack of data really, it, it truly hinders our ability to develop or implement an equity-driven response, particularly for marginalized communities. The second problem statement speaks to the challenge of a, a lack of interoperability between data systems. When hospital, state, or local level health department uh, data systems don't speak to each other, 
or the platforms simply don't exist to collect or share data in a robust way, it really creates, again, discussed earlier today, significant delays and gaps in our public health response. And when it comes to COVID-19 vaccinations, leaders often don't have full visibility into the specific location of vaccine providers in their jurisdictions, how many vaccines are even being allocated to those providers, or the demographics of the people each provider is vaccinating. And again, this lack of robust uh, data really hinders the ability to develop and implement sound equity-driven vaccination strategies. So next slide, please. So for our first problem statement around lack of data, we had three key interim recommendations. So first is that the federal government should mandate the collection and reporting of a comprehensive set of data elements on how COVID-19 is impacting various communities. And it's important to know that this data should include at least information on testing, hospitalizations, deaths, and vaccinations, but it should also include information on how COVID-19 is impacting people based on their type of employment, talking about exposure risk, uh, whether they have an underlying medical condition or, importantly, a disability, and whether they live in a congregate setting, which includes not just nursing homes, but also homeless shelters, jails, and, and prisons. Within this recommendation, we also discussed that this data should include at a minimum key demographic characteristics, so age, race, ethnicity, disability status, sexual orientation, and gender identity, and that more work really needs to be done to address the unacceptable amount of missing or incomplete demographic data in our systems. And importantly, again, as has been discussed today, this data simply has to be disaggregated to really understand how COVID is impacting marginalized, minoritized, and medically underserved communities. Our second interim recommendation for this uh, problem statement is, is that robust data should be incorporated into a COVID-19 equity dashboard that's shared publicly and tracks these metrics by state to help drive and inform the COVID-19 response. I'm incredibly grateful for the work that's already been done to improve this, but we think that this specific dashboard uh, would really help our response. We also think that the federal government could assist state, local, territorial, and tribal governments by developing best practice guidance for how to share information between those entities. And this dashboard will really further help with transparency and implementation of uh, equitable vaccination strategies. And then finally, our third interim recommendation for this statement is about using other, perhaps non-traditional sources of data to drive our, our response. So jurisdictions should absolutely be looking at quantitative, but also qualitative uh, sources of data. So this can include Medicaid data, uh, EMS, community health assessments, uh, community health needs assessments that our hospitals and local health departments have to do, uh, data from disability services and other sources in, in really guiding outreach and vaccination strategies as well as, again, understanding the impact of COVID-19 on marginalized populations. And I, and I really think it was brought up earlier today, but a really important component of our recommendation is that a lack of data, a lack of robust data about a specific population should really not prevent uh, authorities, health authorities, from prioritizing those groups or implementing strategies uh, for people who have increased risk for severe disease or exposure due to underlying health conditions, disabilities, or, or other risk factors. So next slide. Uh, for our second problem statement on lack of interoperability, we had one interim recommendation, which is essentially that the federal government should provide funding and incentives for entities to update their data systems so that this robust data can be shared easily and, importantly, ideally, electronically. There are simply so many uh, different electronic medical records and health department data systems. They're often fraught with challenges in how data is collected or shared. Many of these systems, especially in, in governmental public health, need to be upgraded to be able to share a standardized set of not only robust demographic data, but also data on social and structural drivers of health. So again, things like employment status, housing, those social determinants of health, uh, whether someone has access to transportation or not, having this robust data shared would, would really help assure uh, the response to COVID-19 is, is equity dri driven. So that was our uh, group's initial interim recommendations. I look forward to continuing to refine them. And I also want to, uh, before I turn it back over to you, Madam Chair, open it up for my other subcommittee members to, uh, to fill in there and, and make uh, elevate other things that you think I may have missed.
Mr. Joseph, please. You might be muted, Vic. I was. So first of all, I wanted to just really thank uh, Jonah for being the chair of our committee. She's done a fabulous job um, and helped us work through the issues along with all the staff that were participating in it. Um, one of the challenges that I've seen that we're working through this is just how we're gonna be, how at times we're gonna need to outreach and be very specific on our areas that we bring in. I was listening to, to the three presenters today and one of the things that became very clear to me was that they needed specific recommendations that were gonna help their specific target group that they were looking at. And that became very important to me. Uh, and that's the same challenges that I have seen as I've been working through on the task forces. How am I gonna include American Indian and Alaska Natives with their special relationship with the uh, federal uh, government as identified as sovereign governments ourselves, as well as local states. And I think that becomes really important and essential as we move through this, recognizing that all the areas of concern that we're working through uh, are valid and have their points. I wanna give you an example of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about specific points, if I can, and I'm gonna take a few minutes, so please bear with me. Um, a specific example, a few, and the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act was permanently reauthorized in 2010. This, this, uh, the Indian Health this reauthorization defined 12 TECs or tribal uh, epi epidemiology centers as public health authorities for the purpose of HIPAA privacy rules for data sharing. The permanent reauthorization of uh, the Indian Healthcare Improvement Improvement Act uh, directs the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services to grant each TCC access to the use of data, data sets, monitoring systems, delivery systems, and other protected health information in possession of the Secretary. In certain areas, the Indian Health Service has inexplicably in, interpreted the law in more restrictive manners than allowed by the federal law and regulations, and this interpretation has inhibited data sharing with tribes. Because of this, without the data that's necessary, the TECs or the tribal epidemiology centers cannot conduct public health surveillance for tribal partners, make evidence-based recommendations about public health interventions, qualify and address health disparities and fulfill tribal requests for public health. So there was some recommendations that they came up with and I was wondering how we're gonna be able to be more inclusive, but it's very specific. And if we can generalize this, this would be really great. But if not, then I need it to be incorporated in some way, somehow. That there's a, it's strongly encouraged that the following changes to improve access to health data and TECs and therefore tribal nations. HHS must immediately implement a clear policy that directs all HHS agencies, employees to follow federal law and share data freely with TECs. There's more into that that I can go on later, um, but it also indicates that IHS should be instructed to provide direct access to the RPMS systems for all TECs, and that's the electronic health system that allows them to gather data, which has been problematic and HHS should include specific requirements for real-time line level data sharing with TECs. TECs are very important to our ADA area. It's more than one area of the 12 that we're seeing these problems. A lot of difficulty working with states. Uh, not all states work freely with the tribes, our tribal organizations, so there's the problem there. But with that problem, they're not able to conduct disease surveillance for control and prevention and monitor our tribal communities for future outbreaks or provide tribal specific data to tribal governments to use in developing programs and applying grants or create evidence-based um, programs as to address health disparities. I just feel like it's a very important uh, ask here. It's very specific to the tribes, uh, unless if we can incorporate it in a more general way, I would like to see this incorporated into, uh, it could either be, it's a structural issue, it's a data issue, it could fit somewhere and somehow into this process. And so, Madam Chair, I'm just uh, needed to point that out and sorry for taking so much time. No, but we, 
have all the time in the world, Mr. Joseph. And thank you so much for, for, bringing, for bringing that up, right? So this is really important, uh, the, the tribal epicenters. Um, for a sort of point of order, are you comfortable with uh, sort of the friendly amendment to this to the data slate that the that the subcommittee will follow up on the specifics regarding those relationships and the data sharing? Am, am I comfortable? Yes. Yeah, just yes. for a point of order for us to. Yes. yes. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Caldu. And so we can we can certainly and so that will include the the TECs in the in the slate of recommendations for today is like a friendly amendment to okay. follow up on that. That that worked just perfect for me. Thank you. Right now, thank you for raising it. Absolutely, do not apologize. Appreciate you raising. It. Okay, I I may be out of order. Maybe Dr. Ventures is next. Uh, thank you. So thank you, Dr. Taldoon, and uh, certainly especially to the other uh, members of the subcommittee. I just wanted to point out, you know, we've talked several times in several different ways about how data doesn't exist for very vulnerable groups with high rates of morbidity and mortality. And because we don't know who's dying and who's becoming infected, uh, you know, they're, they're not represented when it comes to resources. And so in several of the presenters uh, today talked about nonprofits and non-governmental organizations as really being critical and standing up data systems. Uh, and that's important, but it should not, and for the next pandemic, cannot absolve governmental organizations from doing that. And so uh, I would specifically point out that uh, we don't know how many people have died in county jails. We have 3,000 county jails around the country, and it's a, it's, a, it's a shame on the country that we can't say how many people have died. We have good nonprofits tracking prison deaths, uh, which I think are still also not that accurate, but um, this is a responsibility of governmental organizations of public health it is not something that should be or or for the next pandemic can be left to nonprofits or non-governmental organizations. We need their help. Um, but that's the role of government and public health. So thank you. Thank you. Andy. Yeah, just real quick. Um, I wanted to just lift up the kind of a, a unique issue with disability data, which is it can be expensive to ask all the questions that one would want to ask to be able to identify a disability population. And we had a good consultation meeting yesterday with Dr. Andrew Houghtonville, who's with the University of New Hampshire and runs a national center on disability statistics. And one of the points that he made in our meeting was sometimes it's about adding questions, but sometimes it's about uh, making the sample size bigger so that you can get meaningful data based on the, the size of the population that you're asking the questions to. So I'm looking forward to kind of drilling down with him more on that, but I just wanted to point out, sometimes it, it does cost money to get good disability data, and historically the federal government has kind of underinvested in collecting that kind of data. Appreciate it. Okay, all of that is officially noted uh, for the minutes. So thank you so much, Dr. Caldoun and the subcommittee, unless there are other comments, again, spot on in terms of identifying salient uh, problem statements and targeted recommendations for our consideration. So I thank you very much. Dr. Okafor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dr. Caldoun and uh, the data analytics and research uh, subcommittee members. Uh, thank you for such an impressive set of uh, recommendations. And now I will call upon our healthcare access and quality subcommittee, and I will turn it over to Tim Putnam. Thank you, Dr. Okafor. I appreciate it. And on behalf of the members of the subcommittee and, and staff, I'd like to bring forward our recommendations. I will tell you the members of the subcommittee are not only talented, but dedicated. Uh, Madam Chair has mentioned how many meetings and how much effort people have put forward. And, and I think each member of the committee has brought forward themselves in this. And, and it really has been, been an honor to be able to work with them. And the staff as well has put a tremendous amount of effort into what I would call making our dreams come true and putting it on print. So 
Thank you so much. I, I think from the beginning, I think we've realized that it is imperative that we make a significant effort to reach everyone. And this is important now, but it's also going to be truly important when we expand inoculations to children. So even though we're in the middle of the uh, vaccination effort, we, we've got a, another group ahead of us uh, that we've got to do this right for. And I think so. some of the recommendations, even though we're saying them now, uh, really we need to apply those when we start vaccinating children. We had a theme and it was reinforced today that the, um, the issue is access more than acceptance. And the Kaiser data bears that out. So much of it is really about uh, how do we increase the access uh, and we need to work on acceptance as well, but it's access. And, and the theme of none of us are safe until most, if not all of us are safe. So there can be no group left out. We came up with four problem statements. Um, number one is many marginalized groups lack access to vaccines due to several reasons, hard to reach rural areas, people without internet connections, and the politically unpopular group like people held in jails and prisons need to have access to care. Uh, and access to vaccines. Problem statement number two is was brought up actually uh, today by Dr. Ayers. Uh, adults and children who lacked access to healthcare beforehand have been exceedingly marginalized. Uh, if you live in an area where your only hospital is closed, you have no act, no healthcare coverage, uh, it's even more important that you have ac vaccine access and that is a priority. Number three is a vaccine process led and delivered by people you trust. The closer we can get socially to individuals, the better chance we have of gaining their trust and, and alleviating their concerns. Um, it has been, and problem statement number four has to do with assuring appropriate access to people that are not affluent. If you have solid internet access, if you have dependable transport, transportation and a flexible work schedule, you're able to access vaccines more easily than people who do not. And that ends up being our fourth problem statement. And next slide, please. So problem statement number one has four recommendations. Um, the first one is really about increasing the number of trusted partners. Uh, what groups want to be part of this that can be? How do we get socially closer to people who've been marginalized and get it, getting the vaccine in hands of trusted partners? One thing we've realized at our facility and we've seen across the nation is people want to be engaged of ending this pandemic. People are tired of it. We want to beat this thing and we want to beat it together. So more groups that we can get engaged that are specifically trusted by the marginalized communities, the sooner we can get the country as a whole vaccinated and the more trust we can gain in it. The second one really is um, about expanding the number of sites um, and the number uh, to get physically closer to the location. So having a mass vaccination site is really helpful in a large, in a large metropolitan area, but not everyone trusts going to a large metropolitan uh, site and how do we become, how do we get physically closer and remove a lot of the barriers uh, that vulnerable people have to it. Third is, simplifying the registration process, making it easier to sign up, whether that's phone, showing up in person, or the registration process needs to be as simple as possible to remove the barriers, whether it be language or others. Fourth is lack of internet access has made it difficult for many people to sign up at all. So that needs to be expanded or there needs to be alternative ways to be able to register for a vaccine. Move to problem number two. Next slide, please. Inflexibility of work schedules has created a real problem. Some people, especially essential workers, cannot take the time off to be able to get vaccinated. They also have a situation where they're fearful that if they have a side effect from the vaccine, they cannot take off work. They cannot miss the, miss the time um, off from work and they're fearful they'll lose their job completely. So we need to understand that, uh, especially for some low age and essential workers that they need to be have paid time off to become vaccinated and reimbursed just on the off chance that they experience a side effect from that. 
completely removing insurance barriers for people. This has been, and it came up in the data today, that some people, when you have to insert your insurance information and they are uninsured, feel that, that they'll have to pay for the vaccine themselves. Um, so there's that barrier as well as the, administra as the people administering the vaccine. If we have to collect that, and I've seen that in our own vaccination site, it slows down the process. We have to have as many people collecting and entering data as we do actually giving vaccines. Actually, we have to have more. Um, this has created a cumbersome process and there's truly better ways to be able to, to get information if we need to or be able to pay the people giving the vaccines other than forcing them to collect insurance data on each and every patient that comes through. Next slide, please. Problem statement number number three, we've got five recommendations here. We need to engage and deploy reserve resources in areas that lack skilled healthcare staff. So some places do not have that and really need to tap into the reserve course, public health service course to be able to do that. Number two is to continue to train and expand the number of licensed and certified healthcare professionals who can safely deliver the vaccine. I think there's been some of that that's been done so far, but I think the more people we can get that can safely and effectively give vaccine, the better we, better success we're going to have. Third is to deploy mobile resources and to communities that need this or can have or, or need more resources than just can be uh, dispensed through the health reserve corps or, or others. Fourth has to do with our community health workers and they have been trusted advisors to their community. They, they have been in the homes, they've been in areas where people trust what they have to say. So significant effort to educate on the vaccine process and the disease process with community health workers and engage them deeper in, in their role to educate the community. We also know physicians and other trusted health sources can be engaged to be able to deliver vaccine and the Again, another step, getting it closer to the patient, getting it in the hands of trusted sources. And problem statement number four on the next slide. We realize that the um, CDC and the AP ACIP have come up with guidelines. Not everyone has followed that. Um, it's important to recognize that, that for a variety of reasons, different states have, have reprioritized them, but we need to take a serious look at that and why they were prioritized and why we need to reach them. Again, if we cannot reach everyone, we will not as a nation be safe. Number two has to do with life expectancy data. And again, Kaiser shared that today. Um, areas with low life expectancy rates and some, some cities are in that situation where there's a variance of over 20 years between one zip code in a city and another of life expectancy. Areas that have low life expectancy should be targeted for vaccine distribution and special plans should be put in place because they are very high at risk. Number three, uh, vaccines protect an individual, but it's important that we have a large percentage of people inoculated. Politically unpopular folks really need to have the ability to be vaccinated. Uh, they've been low on the priority list, but without them, we're not going to be successful. And hard to reach remote locations, recommendation number four, and those with challenges. States should be rewarded for this hard work. It is not easy getting to populations that are resistant, are remote, uh, do not have easy access. Uh, it, we recognize that this is very hard work, but states that do this work and the important work for it should be recognized and rewarded for that. I am certain that I have omitted things that the committee has talked about. So I'd like to turn it over to my committee uh, to correct my errors and omissions. Bobby, you wanna start? Mr. Watts. Oh. Can you try your sound one more time, Mr. Watts? We're not. Okay, we'll circle back. Mr. Taranzo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanted to take this time to actually um, 
share my opinion on our problem statement number one and the experiences we're seeing across the country uh, with this issue and voice my support for the recommendations we've uh, put for this problem statement. Uh, but first I'll, I'll address you know, our, our second recommendation to problem statement number one, which was specifically about vaccine access um, and really reaching those hard to reach communities. Um, so really the strategies that we're looking at is to use established medical mobile services to deliver these vaccines, um, establish vaccination and testing sites that are closest uh, to public transportation essentially, and really ensuring that hours of operation are accessible to all, which is why we're seeing also uh, many uh, people that don't have the time to receive vaccines or get tested, uh, especially disproportionately affected communities or frontline workers. Um, but second, I, I do want to point out the pol politicization of this pandemic in many states not only has uh, really prevented disproportionately affected communities from having access to resources such as testing or vaccinations, um, but also it has promoted the unwillingness to actually uh, give people these this access uh, to vaccines. Uh, so one example, I mean, here in the state of Florida where I'm at, we are seeing that and we're living it. And uh, I do believe that many disproportionately affected communities in the state of Florida and all over the country that are facing uh, the same politicization of this pandemic uh, feel like second class citizens uh, within their own states. So that's all I would like to say on the issue. I just wanted to voice my support. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Watts. Oh, try one more time. Can anyone else hear him? This might be a allowable chat chat moment if you want to to add something in the in the chat for us. But we'll we'll try again, Ms. Turner, and then we'll come back to Mr. Watts. First of all, I'd like to um, give extra kudos to Tim as our chair. Uh, we all work very hard, and he works like double hard. At, at getting everything together. So I wanna, I wanna show my appreciation. Uh, while I, I, I agree with probably 99% of what we have created here, I still have an issue with the telehealth. And this is, in, in this particular month, it was, it's vaccine administration. And to my knowledge right now, you can't give a vaccine through a TV or a computer screen. And it just gives the indication of why in-person is the best. Now, the issue that I have with telehealth is the fact that I, we don't want a two-tiered system created, okay? So many, it's been a, it's been, want of a better word, an epidemic of closing of clinics and hospitals all across the nation in rural and in BIPOC communities. And, to I would hate to think that it's going to be replaced with telehealth without any because right now in our recommendations it's kind of telehealth stands alone with not without any assurance that we're going to have um, increased access to actual hands-on clinics and hospitals. These hospitals and clinics need to reopen, to put it bluntly. And so that would be the one area that I still have concerns. I look forward to discussing it further. Thank you. Thank you. Third time is the charm, Mr. Watts. Yes, I think I'm connected now with the, with the great help of the, the tech. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to take a couple minutes. I have two friendly amendments, and they both stem around problem statement four, which deals with the allocation mm -hmm. by states and localities. And in my opinion, um, too much of the inequity around the allocation of, of determining which groups get prioritized has to do with politics at the local level. And I fear that our recommendations do not go far enough to ensure that the allocation of federally provided vaccines advance the administration's mutually reinforcing goals of equity and having an effective public health response by prioritizing those most at risk. I wanna give two quick examples of where we see politics 
trying to overrule science. One, a bill in the Michigan legislature would have prohibited the use of the social vulner vulnerability index in determining the allocation vaccines by geographic areas. SVI is not perfect, but it was uh, recommended first by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and then by the CDC for, the, for this very purpose. Two, the state of Texas threatened the city of Dallas with the loss of all of its vaccines if it prioritized residents of the hardest hit zip codes. Fortunately, with all adults soon being eligible for, uh, for vaccines, uh, this issue will subside, but it won't completely uh, be eliminated. The forces that seek to further accrue advantage to those who are already privileged will continue their work and those who are vulnerable will still be at risk. I wanna remind us we still have 80% of the, of the adults that still need to be vaccinated. Uh, two thirds have not received any shots. So uh, my, my two friendly amendments are for, uh, for recommendation one, I feel that to strongly recommend that uh, is not enough. My friendly amendment for our consideration is to call on the administration within the limits of legal uh, limits to reduce the ability of states to deviate from ACIP guidelines with the federally supplied vaccines without local public health data to justify that. A second friendly amendment concerns recommendation three. I ask the task force to consider strengthening it by recommending the administration send the set aside supply of vaccines for special populations directly to the health providers serving those populations instead of to the states. This would build upon the existing equity promoting model of this administration, giving vaccines directly to FQHCs, which can reach some special populations like people experiencing homelessness and migrant workers, but would also send vaccines directly to those providing um, prison health services, for example. In conclusion, whenever politics overrules science, inequity abounds, and the politically weaker are the ones who mm -hmm. suffer. In a pandemic, public health suffers, which means that all of us suffer. Thank you for considering these two friendly amendments. Thank you, sir. While others perhaps might have um, uh, comments or response, I just wanted a point of clarification for the friendly amendment for uh, under problem statement number three. Um, it, what I'm currently looking at says states should have set aside allotment of vaccines for providers to vaccinate. It was the was the friendly amendment that the it should be federal supply to providers? I just want to make sure I understood. Uh, that the set aside should not be going to the states. They should be going to the providers, the health providers that are serving those special populations. The, the federal, like the federal, should go directly to the. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, other discussion, thoughts? On the amendment, Dr. Hildred, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I just wanna emphasize one thing that I think is very important. To achieve the goal of vaccinating as many of us that need to be vaccinated, we will have to expand the pool of vaccinators, those administering the vaccine shots. And I think it's very important that every effort be made to make sure that those individuals represent the communities that they're gonna be vaccinating. In other words, every effort be made to make sure that there's an inclusive um, effort uh, so that the people who are administering the shots look like those who are being vaccinated. I think that's really important. Um, and we talked about that in our discussions, but I wanna emphasize that point. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Martinez, and then Mr. Joseph. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, great presentation, really interesting. Um, in, in adding to uh, what Dr. Hilbreth just pointed out, uh, I was thinking about the very same thing, uh, but also it seems to me that uh, we are the United States of America, we have a federal government, it's a large enterprise, we have amazing resources. Uh, we lack, it seems, the political will to bring those resources together where we could have truly a multi-pronged, flexible, culturally centered approach to vaccination. There should not be mutually exclusive, it's not mutually exclusive which approach we should take. We should have taken multiple approaches. The max vac sites, yes. Community-based organizations should have been stood up at the same time, along with mobile units at the same time, as well as person to person, knowing that we were gonna have hard to count. 
I mean, it's not like we haven't done something very similar, I would say, in the last century. We vaccinated many individuals, but also I'd point out it was brought up earlier that we've also done other activities like the census where we do have hard to count communities. So we have models of how to do this. So my point here is let's, let's mobilize resources. Let's ensure that they're culturally centered. I love Dr. Hill's point about, and as much as possible, standing up the workforce to look like the communities, but it shouldn't be mutually exclusive where we decide, oh, we can only stand up and do this one approach. Th that is that is inadequate. If that's the way we handled our national defense, we'd be in a world of trouble. Thank you. Then Mr. Joseph, please. Um, just responding to uh, Ms. Turner's comments regarding broadband. In Alaska, many of our small rural communities that are only accessible by planes rely heavily on broadband. Now, the unique thing about this, many of those communities are served by health aids that's uh, unique to the tribal health system in Alaska that is potentially, uh, that is gonna be spreading out to other tribal communities. But the health aids are re uh, required to have real uh, stringent relationships with their provider, uh, the provider supervisor or their collaborative supervisor provider. With that being said, without that interface, they wouldn't be able to administer the vaccine. And because of the challenges afterward, after the vaccine, and we know that not all people feel very well, there are side effects to some of, some of the vaccines and they're impacted with that, they would need to have direct access to a provider that's usually provided by broadband if the health aid couldn't be fault providing that care. So, Broadband is very important and, it's, and I just wanted to share that and let um, Ms. Turner understand what's happening from a tribal perspective and the importance of it and how it does help with vaccinations. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, uh, three for three, looking for four for four. Dr. Okafor, please, really tremendous work. Thank you, thank you. Um, just great, remarkable uh, sets of interim recommendations from our Healthcare Access and Quality Subcommittee. Thank you again for all the work and commitment and dedication to this mission. So I'll turn it over actually to our fourth subcommittee our structural drivers and xenophobia. Uh, they actually focused on this issue and it is uh, my joy to call upon, okay, you have it, call upon Hei Young to take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Um, so um, I also want to thank our subcommittee members. What was so amazing about our subcommittee was that everyone who participated had not only just the commitment, but the depth and the richness of the experience, given um, so the range of where they were living, where they were working, the, the area in which that they were, uh, the areas of expertise, I think really contributed to making both identifying what our problem statements are, but more importantly, uh, developing uh, actionable recommendations. So can we go to the next slide? So two problem statements for our group. Um, I think that um, our speakers have addressed this and it's been raised in other subcommittee members. Um, the COVID pandemic really showed many, exposed many things for us. One of the core things that has uh, really laid bare is our nation's longstanding structural inequities, whether that's social, economic, gender-based, but these inequities revealing that individuals and communities who've been hit hardest by COVID-19 are also experiencing structural barriers to access vaccination. And the second problem, as our Madam Chair talked about, the this task force dedicating some of its time and energy, both discussing, identifying, but also developing actionable recommendations and guidance in. Uh, to address the rise of xenophobia, racism, anti-Asian violence in the context of current pandemic. As we all know that xenophobia, racism, 
anti-Asian violence are nothing new, but a wave of incidents of hate against Asians, Asian Americans, Pacific Islands. Um, and I would uh, welcome uh, Dr. Islam's uh, presentation and to also include the Native Hawaiians here, um, and that this group of Asians, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians have experienced um, the rise of Anti the violence in the midst of this COVID pandemic. So can we go to the next slide? So in terms of tackling the problems, the statement one in terms of what to do about addressing not just um, how to access, how to help uh, marginalized communities, the communities who've been hit hardest by the COVID-19, what are the uh, structures that we need to overcome to ensure that they have both access to the uh, information and the appointments and actually get vaccinated. Um, and then it's also really thinking about what are the other ba structural barriers for, um, that it speaks to their lived experiences that is preventing them from coming forward or making it easier for them to access the vaccination. So as other committees, subcommittees are talked about, really diversifying a, a ways in which that people can register, right? And really move away from what's just largely been an online appointments process to have uh, the the appointments, the registration to be in person or the phone that are allowing and really addressing the inaccessibility people may have due to their language barriers, cultural barriers or access to or lack of access to broadband. And then also this, um, I think the President Biden has been uh, forcefully talking about that we have to go where the people are in terms of um, having the ability for people to access vaccines. So really figuring out and, and also working very closely with local and state governments, but also community-based organizations, faith communities, to really localize venues where the vaccine can happen and it's bringing to the closer to the communities where they're at, especially the underserved communities, and to do so in such a way that it is really flexible and really responding to the needs of the um, these communities that's underserved, who's been hit hardest by the COVID-19. Um, and in terms of, so it's one thing to really think about making the registration appointment locations available, but we also have to address other structural barriers that is uh, making it difficult people to uh, access it. So I think it's really thinking about um, connections to the, I think other communities talked about making sure there is um, transportation accessibility, there may be making sure there's uh, broadband, but also I want to drill down and spend some time talking briefly about um, the relationship between um, uh, people's employment or lack of paid leave and lack of job security and how that further contributes for barriers for accessing uh, uh, a vaccine. So I represent domestic workers, and we've been hearing some troublesome news that domestic workers are being told by their employers that they should not come back to work until they're vaccinated or that they're, they're losing their jobs because the fact that they're not able to get the appointments in a timely basis. So really want to drill down here and talk about that there should not be any kind of conditioning of employments on vaccination. Um, and then I think other subcommittees really talked about the investment in uh, making sure that workers have paid time off before, during, and after, right? And that we should not be placing um, anyone in our country to make that impossible choice between do I go get vaccinated or do I go to work because I need to earn that paycheck. Um, and then also really thinking about addressing um, other uh, uh, barriers such as, and I want to uh, turn it over to my um, subcommittee member, Victor Joseph, to talk a little bit about what are some issues of in different regions like that climate conditions, right, that is uh, posing a barrier that allows us to address those needs so that, again, these communities are uh, able to access efficiently, effectively, and timely. Uh, let's go to this problem number, statement two. 
So the second problem is in terms of addressing xenophobia. So we have three interim recommendations, which is similar to what our, both our speakers and other subcommittee members talked about, is really working with um, the federal agencies should be working local with local state governments, but also with community groups to really drive a community center solutions to target and reach um, um, API communities to access vaccines, right? And I think that it's really, um, and really take what Dr. Islam talked about in terms of the, the important need of uh, disaggregating our data, right? I think that disaggregation data will give us to really talk about our second interim recommendation of creating an effective vaccine distribution infrastructure so that that disaggregated data allows us to distribute vaccine much more accurately equitably and really targeted approach to make sure that we are allocating vaccine and distributing in such a way that is meeting the needs of uh, communities. So even so not to lump all of Asian communities together, not to lump over 20 different um, communities, but really disaggregating and understanding it, I think allows us to identify um, that who are the most underserved even within the Asian community. And so lastly, just to echo what Dr. Islam talked about, the importance of both the federal government to collaborate with other relevant agencies and stakeholders to both collect information, but also make sure to disaggregate that data, right? So it is truly speaking to the needs of these various uh, communities that have different needs and experiences. And I would just stress here that importance of that the disaggregation of data is so much needed, not just in the context of health, but it is very much needed in other arenas. Like this is a very similar situation, whether it's in the housing situation or the employment. So I'll stop there. And before I turn it over to Madam Chair, open it up for other subcommittee members to add. Well, uh, I just want to once again thank Kay Young uh, as she was chairing our subcommittee. She's done a fabulous job. She's always ready to roll and uh, it, it's just a great pleasure to work with the other committee members as well. Uh, that being said, you asked me specifically to talk about some of the uh, factors regarding global warming and the impacts of that climate change. Well, um, many of you probably heard on a national perspective, a lot of coastal communities that's been impacted by uh, climate change and to the point where whole communities have to leave or be um, moved to another location. What you probably haven't heard was a lot of the in-river communities are having some similar problems with bank erosions and stuff like that, that uh, harms infrastructure that needs to be moved out of the way such as electrical power, um, water and sewer systems, or even uh, communication systems. Earlier, we talked about the importance in one of the presentations about needing uh, the type of technology that could be used to communicate back and forth with individuals. Uh, you know, even if we did get broadband out to our communities right now, that doesn't cover individuals necessarily because only the clinic usually has reliable broadband and not even the tribal offices. The water and sewer systems are really limited to some places just to a washateria um, and where homes are not connected to running water. Phone systems are unreliable and in many of our rural areas phones can go out um, for a couple days at a time. In fact when I in, in our area, I had to send out satellite phones just to make sure that there was some phone coverage for the communities at times. Uh, all that being said, you know, climate change is real. It does have a real impact. And as we look at structural concerns in transportation, um, there have, because of the weather patterns and stuff that has been changing, there's been more impact on that. We're not able to really rely on the uh, airline services that provide services out to our communities. In fact, um, recently I just learned that in order to get some people vaccinated, we're actually flying from 
them from their communities into our home community, our, to the hub here in Fairbanks, putting them up in a hotel and then flying them back out the next day if the airlines are flying. And so there's been a lot of uh, challenges when it comes to transportation in Alaska. Uh, some of it's not unique, some of it is, and specifically related to COVID. But the point is, is to access in the transportation or the structure that is being challenged in order to make this happen. I think I explained that fairly well. Uh, uh, hey, Young. Okay, with that, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Joseph. So I'm gonna, Dr. Martinez, we'll turn it to you. And then after that, we'll just, I know just mindful of the time and some of our task force members, I think might need to transition. So after your comment, we will take up the slates for voting consideration. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, hey Young, as our chair, Barca Committee did a great, fantastic job. So thank you, Hey Young, for the presentation. Uh, I just wanna comment on the structural drivers, the social determinants and political determinants of health of how important they really are and really a uh, sort of charging our federal partners and the enterprise itself that a cross systems approach is critical to really maximizing effectual impact. Um, as an example, uh, at the community level, uh, the need for braided funding to be able to bring together the different uh, you know, funding uh, units, uh, be they from the Department of Education, say, with along with a, with the Health and Human Services, and, and, and to be able to address the issues that are happening at the local level, it really will give such flexibility and stand up the creativity that's coming from our communities, where they can really, you know, implement some of the charges and that we're setting forth and some of the changes. So, just uh, at making the ask that a cross systems approach could be very beneficial. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, so four, so, so four for four. Oh, sorry. Mary, do you have something specific to the structural drivers? I actually do. I just wanted yes. to clarify because I had seen in other slides most recent about the whole vaccine passport. Now I didn't hear it today. And so before I vote, I uh, want to know if that's been omitted or where we stand with that. Hey, Young. Hey, Young. I think we did include it. Martha, can you go back to the um, apologies if I didn't note that, but it is part of in the condensed PowerPoint and it is definitely reflected in the, uh, it, will, it should be reflected in the uh, uh, additional, in the future I, I, recommendations. Yes, the language specifically says prohibit vaccination being made a condition of employment when workers are unable to obtain the vaccine and require that any vaccination passport system must be developed with equity at the center. That is the language. So I would wanna go on record as being against the whole concept of vaccine passports. Um, it, it just becomes a, if for not, no other reason, it, 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 with an employment, et cetera, it would give, um, if they knew I had a passport for vaccine, they could say, well, Mary, you don't need N95s anymore. You don't need personal protective equipment. You're vaccinated. Or as far as equity, you know, people being able to get the vaccine and maybe then their ability to go one place to another. Um, it just becomes a huge equity issue. So I want to just be in against it. Thank you. Okay. I'm sure we will revisit the, that conversation and that topic uh, in future as well around that. Um, so... Right, perfect. So thank you, everyone. Just mindful of the time. Um, the, the groups worked very, very hard. Thank you for all the thoughtfulness to present those slates. I would like us to have an opportunity to, to consider voting on moving those forward. Remember, reminder, these are interim recommendations. So we are voting now in support of slates of interim recommendations. There were very uh, several friendly amendments made will be taken back to, to subcommittee. So at this point, the vote is about moving forward with the slates towards that next uh, process of continued revision. Um, unless there are any questions about process, then I'll just go right through each of, of the, the slates. Okay. All right, so we'll start with, uh, in the order they were presented with communications and collaborations. Um, I'd like to entertain a motion, please. So moved, Victor. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Dr. Hildreth. Thank you so much. Any further discussion? 
All right, hearing none, I'll ask all those in favor of the slate of recommendations to signify by raising your hand if it's an aye. Thank you. One moment. <laughs> you cannot vote twice, Dr. Uh, Mike. Uh, <laughs> Chair, um, uh, Myra is on the road and couldn't ah, vote. Yes, thank you. To vote in, on her behalf. <laughs> that is allowed, that's true, I do know that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, any nays? Right. Any abstentions? Sorry, I didn't vote fast enough. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And I vote yes. Motion carries. All right. Next slate. Make sure I'm going in correct order. Data analytics and research subcommittee. I'll entertain oh, yeah. a, mo a motion. Thank you. Who seconds? Second, Octavia. Much appreciated. Any further discussion? All right, hearing none, please uh, signify a I vote by raise of hand. Any nays? Anybody abstaining? Ready? I vote yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Okay. Healthcare Access and Quality Subcommittee. I'll entertain a motion on the slate, please. Motion to approve. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Mm -hmm. Hearing none. Yes. Please, uh, Dr. Hildreth, is that is that for discussion or for voting? <laughs> voting. <laughs> please signify um, I by raise of hand. Thank you. Any, thank you. Uh, nay? Abstentions? Thank you. Good. I vote yes. All right. And I will entertain a motion for the slate of recommendations proposed by the Structural Drivers and Xenophobia Subcommittee, please. So moved, Octavio. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank yes. you. Any discussion? <laughs> Okay. Can we hear it? Hearing none, we can go ahead and please signify I support by raising hand. Thank you. Uh, nay? Oh, let me take my hand down. <laughs> <laughs> Abstentions? Thank you very much. I vote yes, motion carries. All right, thank you very much. So for the record, for the four slates of recommendations that were put forward today, they will carry forward back to the subcommittee. These are interim. The friendly amendments that were raised will be considered. Revisions will also be considered. Um, uh, and uh, we will revisit those recommendations again in the future. Thank you, everyone, the committees, for your hard work. Oh, my goodness. I wish I could give you chocolates through the Zoom. <laughs> tremendous, tremendous, tremendous work. Thank you. I appreciate everybody also tolerating a little change in our agenda there just to accommodate task force member time. Appreciate the rich discussion. I will turn it to Dr. Went now for public comment. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Now, now we have the opportunity to receive public comments. So our first comment is from Dr. Sean Cahill from the Fenway Institute. Please go ahead and unmute yourself if you are on Zoom. You have three minutes and the time starts now. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, you need to unstop my video, please. Okay. Okay, hi everyone, uh, Madam Chair and Task Force members. I'm Sean Cahill from the Fenway Institute in Boston. I'm speaking on behalf of the LGBTQI Federal Health Policy Roundtable. We encourage the Biden-Harris administration to issue federal guidance requiring the collection and reporting of data on sexual orientation, gender identity, and intersex status, or SOGI, in COVID-19 testing, care, and vaccination. Why is this important? First, sexual and gender minority people, or SGM people, may be more vulnerable to infection with the novel coronavirus. 
SGM people are nearly twice as likely to work in frontline jobs like retail and food services. Many live in urban areas where social distancing is difficult, and SGM people are more likely to be low income. A recent survey found that SGM people of color were more likely than straight cisgender people of color to test positive for COVID-19, and twice as likely to test positive as SGM white people. Second, SGM people are more likely to have chronic conditions such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and asthma, and risk factors like smoking, vaping, and substance use disorder that may put them at risk for complications from COVID-19. Third, sexual minority women, transgender people, and SGM people of color are less likely to access routine preventive care, uh, and this may inhibit their ability to access COVID-19 testing, care, and vaccination. SGM people must be included in vaccine dissemination plans and SOGI data must be collected to ensure equitable vaccine uptake. SGM people experience medical mistrust, which could affect willingness to get the vaccine. A recent analysis in the journal Vaccine found that black and Native American men who have sex with men were less willing to get vaccinated than white, Latino, and Asian American MSM. Federal guidance requiring SOGI data collection could come from CDC or somewhere else in HHS. The CDC COVID-19 case report form needs to add SOGI questions and change its current sex question. Right now, the sex response options are male, female, other, and unknown, and these are not affirming. We also ask that the National COVID Cohort Collaborative add SOGI to its COVID-19 Clinical Data Warehouse Data Dictionary. Currently, this collaborative does not allow for research on SGM populations' experiences with COVID-19. In the midst of the worst global pandemic of our lifetimes, our federal government and most state governments are not collecting and reporting SOGI data so that we know how COVID-19 is affecting SGM people, including people of color and elders. I am heartened by Dr. Khaldun's presentation today and hope to work with the task force and the Data Analytics and Research Committee to help address this important data equity issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Cahill. Next, we'll have Mr. Danny Chan from the Justice for In Aging. Please go ahead and unmute your, your mic. You have three minutes and it's start now. Mr. Chan. All right, we will go next to um, Dr. Bonnie Swenner from the Johns Hopkins Disability Health Research Center. Please go ahead and unmute yourself and your three minutes starts now. Thank you. My name is Bonnie Lynn Swenor. I'm the director of the Johns Hopkins University Disability Health Research Center. I lead the COVID-19 vaccine dashboard for people with disabilities that Dr. Kara Ayers discussed, and my center is working as fast as possible to continue to expand that resource. My comment intends to elevate some lessons learned from that dashboard project about how persistent gaps in disability data have widened health inequities, including in the vaccine rollout during the pandemic for the disability community. The disability community has historically been excluded from many data collection opportunities, perpetuating gaps in evidence and creating formidable barriers <clears throat> to health equity for people with all types of disabilities. As we say at my center, who counts depends on who is counted. These deep disability data gaps have impacted COVID-19 tracking efforts. And I asked the task force to consider the following to support efforts to surveil and address COVID-19 and related inequities for the disability community. One, Ensure disability is included in all national and state surveys and public health data systems. Current data gaps have prevented us from being able to track the impact of COVID-19 on people with disabilities and continues to limit us from identifying and addressing the structural and accessibility barriers to achieving vaccine equity for disabled people. Two, to collect disability data at all healthcare interactions while data on age, race, ethnicity, and gender identity are routinely collected in medical records, disability is not assessed. This information is necessary to track COVID-19 outcomes and vaccine rates for people with disabilities, and without this information, efforts to achieve vaccine equity will remain inadequate. Three, 
to ensure disability data allows for the examination of intersecting identities. Health equity efforts, including efforts to track gaps in the vaccine rollout, cannot ignore the intersectionality between disability and race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, geographic location, and other groups. But without robust and disaggregated disability data at state and national levels, this work is impossible. And four, funding the development of disability data infrastructure, disability research, and supporting the inclusion of the disability community in these efforts is needed. Without resources, our work cannot move forward and vaccine gaps and health inequities in the disability community will go underrecognized and unaddressed. Leading this COVID dashboard has taught me that we must re-examine how we approach disability research and related public health efforts. Filling gaps in disability data cannot wait. This work requires innovation, multidisciplinary collaboration, must start with meaningful partnerships with the disability community and should ensure that resulting information is shared back and with the community and made accessible to people with disabilities. During the pandemic, the absence of disability data has often been interpreted as absence of risk or inequity. And as a result, the disability community has been excluded from many pandemic response efforts. That must change. Data is powerful. And my hope is that this task force will work to close these critical disability data gaps and support the creation of better disability data infrastructure, which is a necessary and essential step to advancing health equity for the disability community, both during the pandemic and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Osmano. Next, we have Dr. Harold Smith from the University of Pennsylvania. Please go Hi. ahead. Yes, hi, my name is Harold Schmidt. I'm an assistant professor of medical ethics and health policy at the University of Pennsylvania. I want to congratulate the chair, the task force members and the staff for everything you've done so far. I just continue to be in awe of your energy and relentless focus. It's really just so inspiring. Um, I'm also grateful for the opportunity to provide some brief comments now. And I would like to raise three points that first, allocating in ways that recognizes disadvantage needs to continue as we near vaccines for all. That second, states and cities with below average vaccination rates and above average shares of disadvantaged communities need particular attention as we transition to this next phase. And third, that idea requirements must not be barriers to particularly vulnerable populations. So first on allocating ways that recognizes disadvantage. In a little over a week, states will open vaccine eligibility to all residents, but disadvantage and vulnerability still matter. The general population is not a uniform group. Many can safely wait a little longer, but many cannot. If we just switch from one day to the next, from structured phases to mostly inequitable first click, first serve, we'll no doubt be successful to vaccinate a large number of people. But for equity and public health, it's key to make sure that more vulnerable groups are not pushed aside by population groups who may be just as impatient as everybody else to get a vaccine, but are far less vulnerable. So many more disadvantaged groups, including larger shares of people of color, are at the end of their abilities to withstand the economic shock of the pandemic. And receiving a vaccine is far more urgent for them than for the better off. Using a disadvantage index such as the CDC Social Vulnerability Index that the National Academies recommended should be used in all phases, including the general population, remains critical. Uh, our most recent review of states' use of indices has found that by the end of March, we now have 37 jurisdictions and the majority of states, 34 states, use a disadvantage index. And I'll share this in the written version of this comments. It's not too late to universalize adoption and likely helpful if the task force urged all jurisdictions to explore how they can use disadvantage indices for planning dispensing site locations outreach and communication, increasing allocations, and monitoring and adjusting allocations. Then we need to recognize that not all states are equal as they open the gates. While all states are the same in being asked to open vaccine eligibility on April 19, all states are not the same in their vaccine uptake rates, and they're not the same in their shares of disadvantaged populations. So opening vaccines to all should be to the benefit of all, but given where we are, it's not clear that it will be. So what this means is that for equity and public health, we need to pay particular attention to states and cities with below average vaccination rates and above average shares of disadvantaged communities as opening in such situations will very likely make it harder for more disadvantaged groups to receive vaccines. We therefore need to be able to monitor closely and swiftly adjust if needed access, communication, outreach and allocations in such states and not simply see all states as starting from the same situation because they're not. The mentioned equity dashboard that was uh, mentioned earlier seems highly promising here. And then finally, idea requirements must not be barriers to particularly vulnerable populations. As Samantha Artiga noted earlier, a particularly vulnerable group are immigrants, both documented and undocumented. And thanks to the chilling effects of the public charge rule, 
many immigrants are understandably, even if wrongly, concerned about seeking a vaccine. And where they do try to register, seeing that they're asked to provide ID and insurance will turn off many. States including New Jersey, Wisconsin, Illinois, and North Carolina recognize this in their allocation plans and prescribe that ID and insurance must not be required. Yet, for example, in North Carolina, Onslow County does require ID, so there's an urgent need to correct such misalignment. And in addition, all states should enable vaccines with no questions asked. With that, I thank you for the opportunity to share these comments and again for your outstanding work and we'll follow up with written comments too. Thank you, Dr. Smidge. Next speaker is Ms. Pella Whitecker from the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Please go ahead, you have three minutes. Good afternoon, my name is Pilar Whitaker and I serve as counsel at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Over the past year, we have analyzed federal data collection directives and tracked demographic data published by the states and federal government. Based on this, we recommend that HHS and the CDC align their data reporting guidance for labs, hospitals, and vaccine providers with the 2011 HHS data standards. Those standards include 14 different racial and five different ethnic subgroups. This is compared to just five racial and two ethnic subgroups currently tracked. The department can absolutely accomplish this pursuant to its express authority under Section 4302 of the Affordable Care Act. Revised guidance must also require the reporting of primary language and disability status, as well as other demographic points that correspond with social vulnerabilities. Such data points can include employment, housing, and insurance status, as well as sexual orientation and gender identity. As you are all aware, President Biden has now issued two executive orders noting the importance of complete disaggregated data and ensuring an equitable pandemic response. However, calls for disaggregated health data are not new. In 1985, HHS similarly noted, quote, data must be disaggregated by race and ethnicity, providing detail within major ethnic groups such as Hispanics, end quote. Now, 40 years later, the federal government's failure to collect disaggregated data is inexcusable. In the three months since President Biden's executive order, there has not been a single revision to any COVID-19 data reporting requirements. HHS has failed to apply its 2011 data collection standard to any COVID-19 data collection efforts, despite its statutory authority to do so. Also, there is no federal directive requiring data, data reflecting, in the president's words, those living at the margins of our economy. Our analysis also revealed differences between governmental data collection tools such as, such as case report, report forms and be safe and reporting requirements for providers. When coupled with the lack of data infrastructure and education at the provider level, these factors have resulted in woefully incomplete race and ethnicity data. I ask you today to issue recommendations on data and reporting collection requirements. Lives are at stake. First, HHS and CDC must issue guidance clarifying that labs, hospitals, and vaccine providers must collect disaggregated race and ethnicity data, ethnicity data in accordance with the 2011 HHS standards. Two, HHS guidance must direct these providers to report data in each of the following categories, primary language, disability status, sexual orientation, gender and gender identity, employment status, pregnancy status, housing status, insurance type and income, Finally, HHS and CDC should ensure that all data collected directly at the federal level through case report forms, be safe, and FEMA-run vaccination sites mirror these affirmation data categories. The Lawyers Committee will be issuing a report that will expound upon these and other issues in the coming days. We appreciate the task force taking on these absolutely critical health equity issues. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wataiko. Next. Uh, we have Ms. Elena Ong from the Satchel Health Leadership Institute Health Equity Task Force. Please go ahead and you'll have three minutes. Hi, I'm honored to have this opportunity to read a summary of a United Against Racism letter that was signed by more than 100 leaders from the American Indian, Asian American, Black Disability, Latinx, LGBTQ, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, white, and or women's communities to show solidarity with Asian Americans. We must understand the killings of six Asian American women in context. For exactly a year ago, the phrase China virus went viral and that serial tweet fueled xenophobic racism and led to deadly discrimination. Since 2020, Asians globally and domestically have been experiencing two epidemics, COVID-19 and xenophobic racism. 
Asian Americans have been verbally harassed and physically attacked. When customers stopped patronizing Asian operated businesses, many were forced to close. Many Asian Americans suffer from extremely high unemployment rates. Stigmatized, murdered, blamed, and shamed, Asian Americans went into hiding. Many were deterred by anti-Asian hate from reporting race and ethnicity. Statistics were invisibilized when Asian and Pacific Islanders were lumped into the same category. Data were not collected by the level of disaggregation necessary to address the true impact of COVID-19 on Philippine X and other groups. The dearth of linguistic and culturally competent outreach may have also contributed to COVID-19 under-testing. Unusually low COVID case rates and unusually high COVID-19 case fatality rates Without a proportionately higher recorded COVID-19 case rates, Asian Americans were left out of equitable vaccine prioritization. Will they be left out of vaccination, further vaccination? So today we're at a critical flashpoint. The hate toll is 3,800 and rising. While we encourage the community to report incidents of hate and language barriers, we also must protect Asian Americans and ensure their access to vaccines. We applaud President Biden for issuing the memorandum condemning and combating racism and xenophobia and urging Congress to pass hate crime legislation. We look forward to working with elected officials and administrators to ensure that resources are prioritized to protect communities from racism. We stand united against racism and other isms because no one is safe until we're all safe from racism, xenophobia, sexism, poverty, ableism, homophobia, houselessness. And I recommend intersecting U.S. Department of Justice civil rights recommendations with President Biden's memos, particularly item one on hate crimes, item six, non-English languages, and item seven, data to ensure equal outcomes. I also recommend real-time transparent data to get the vaccine to those experiencing access barriers. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ms. Ong. I just want to call one more time for Mr. Danny Jan, in case you have technical problem connecting before. All right. It doesn't seem like he would be on. So that would be uh, concluded the public comment. So back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Dr. Wendt. Thanks to everyone for the public comment. We always find that incredibly valuable. And thank you to everybody for participating in our second meeting. Just want to take an opportunity, a special thanks to each of our subcommittee chairs, to all of the task force members. A just incredibly impressive slate of recommendations brought forward today for interim consideration. Um, and of course, for your unwavering commitment to health equity. Uh, a brief note of thanks, of course, as well to Secretary Becerra, Assistant Secretary Levine for joining us at the top of the meeting. And to everyone, the HHS family is large uh, for supporting the work of this group. For our guest experts today, you know, Ms. Ortega, Dr. Islam, Dr. Ayers, for joining. Thank you so much. Um, and you heard reference as we went through the day. There have been many, many, many subject matter experts who have shared their wisdom with us in this process, as well as uh, other stakeholders. We will continue to uh, to engage with them moving forward. Um, so I, I think people should feel very proud about today. We've continued our work towards recommendations. Um, we identify challenges, but also opportunities. We know that the data is foundational and at the core. Uh, we will remain committed to making advances on data and to being focused on data-driven work and response. But we also considered strategies, specific guidances. Um, we voted uh, for our first time. We're specific to equitable vaccine access as well as acceptance. So our commitment to you, we will continue to report out on the ongoing work of the subcommittees at our next full task force meeting. That meeting will focus most likely on mental and behavioral health. The date and time will be provided when the meeting notice is published in the Federal Register and will be available on the task force website. We all feel and sense that urgency. We have to meet the moment. We have to be committed to disrupting that narrative the one in our country that consistently picks the same winners, the same losers in times of national crisis. Access to COVID-19 resources and to future opportunity must be equitable. So with that, 
I want to thank the team behind the scenes. You've met some, but not all. You know, thank you to Captain Sam Wu, our DFO. He's currently deployed. Thank you for your service. To Dr. Min Wen, who stepped up today, serving as our interim DFO in his absence. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Martha Okafor, on detail to us from ACF. Thank you so much, ACF, for sharing her talent and for serving, of course, as our executive director. Thank you to Alex Hellinger, who was on detail with us from HRSA, Commander Josephine uh, Nguyen, White House Fellow. Thank you to Senior Advisor Ms. Sharice Perry, Special Assistant Ms. Caitlin Pennington, to Ms. Bonnie Mason for administrative support. It's like the Grammys. To the, to the OASH communication team, you know, thank you so much, of course, to our ASL interpreters today. And the many, many others, it's too many even to mention, who are behind the scenes supporting this work uh, and making it all so seamless. So we continue to look forward to the work ahead together. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Winter Jonas. Thank you, Madam Chair. So with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Be well, everyone.